This is Heartland Romance, a Heartland Cowboy Christmas Sweet Romance, Book Three. Written by Jesse Gusman. Performed by J. Dice. Chapter One. That's fine. You don't need to be here during business hours. You know I'll leave it outside by the back door between the trash cans, and you can pick it up any time. Elias Emerson shoved a hand in his pocket and looked out the one-way glass from his office into the retail part of his farm equipment store. He said a few more words into the phone before hanging up. Several customers were being taken care of by the cashier on duty, and off to the side, through the open door into the big shop, he could see several more employees working on fixing things, like the drive shaft that he had just been talking to Neil Richardson about. Business was booming. He was almost debt-free. He helped out occasionally on his family's farm, and his life was going better than he ever could have pictured it. He should be completely satisfied. I just booked three more repairs for next week. If we get any more in, you're going to have to decide whether you want to pay your guys overtime or whether you want to push them off to the following week. That's the state corn festival. Behind him, his best friend and not exactly business partner, Catherine Connolly, sat at her desk, her hair neatly pulled back away from her face, her attire not exactly New York City fancy, but not Prairie Rose, Iowa casual either. Not that he usually noticed what she wore. She was just there. Let's do overtime. We're coming into the busy season, and there are sure to be more calls coming in. When it's time to harvest, you lose money for every minute that you sit around waiting on equipment breakdowns. I thought that's what you'd say. Catherine typed a few things into the computer in front of her, and then made a note on the pad of paper beside her. Catherine managed an online equipment sales company for a well-known brand name machinery outlet, and she had all of her warranty work sent to his shop. Technically, she could pretty much work from home, but it did help him that they worked in the same building. While they didn't work for each other, and their businesses were separate, there was so much overlap that sometimes it was hard to tell one from the other. Catherine looked up, her brows drawn together. Speaking of the corn festival, are we still taking your niece with us? As far as I know. Braxton hasn't said anything different. And with Krista ready to have the baby any time, I don't think they're going to make the two-hour drive. Catherine smiled, and Elias figured it was all because of Arian. She and Arian, his niece, had a great rapport, and Arian loved spending time with Catherine. During the summer when school was out, Arian was often in the office. Catherine had even set up a little desk for her and brought in one of her old laptops from home. He'd thought it was all for play, but Catherine and Arian had shocked him when they informed him that Arian was actually helping Catherine with her business. For real. That's great. Now that Krista is around, we probably don't have to worry about reminding Braxton to make sure she has a pre-approved excused absence from school. I'm sure Krista will take care of it. Elias hadn't considered that, but Catherine was probably right. He hated to admit it, but she usually was. Hey, boss. A voice came from the doorway, and Elias turned. There'd been something nagging at the back of his head, and as he looked at Catherine, he felt like he could almost catch whatever it was, but it was gone as soon as he'd heard the voice and he shifted his focus to the door, stuffing down the irritation he felt. He hated having the feeling that he was missing something. Just wanted to let you know I was grabbing lunch in the back, Perry said as he stuck his head in the door, nodding and smiling at Catherine before turning his gaze back to Elias. Elias nodded. When you come back in, I have some deliveries that need to be shelved if things slow down this afternoon. You got it, boss. Perry said, giving him a nod before ducking back out, grabbing his sack lunch, and heading toward the back door where there was a picnic table and garbage can set up. 
Catherine didn't do too much with the guys out front, since her sales business was all online, and her head had gone back down as her fingers flew over the keyboard while Elias talked. Ram's having dinner this evening. I assumed you were coming, he said, remembering that he was supposed to ask her two weeks ago and never had. It didn't matter. Catherine was never doing anything anyway. I am. Actually, I was talking to Graham last week, and she mentioned it. I'm going over immediately after work to give her a hand. Oh, do you want me to go along? Normally, they did everything together. He'd just been kind of assuming that he'd take her. He supposed they'd been friends for so long they'd become the kind of friends who didn't really need to have big, long discussions, but felt comfortable with each other, and had developed a routine from which they seldom deviated. It felt comfortable, and he liked that. He didn't like that she was doing something different, although it seemed silly to mention it. I was going to drive to her house straight after work. She lifted a shoulder without lifting her eyes from her computer, her fingers still flying over the keys. Something felt off, but he brushed the feeling aside and strode over to his desk. He had a few things he needed to work on. He also wanted to carry the boxes from the back room where they'd been delivered and put them in the store where he wanted the display set up. Maybe after we're done eating this evening, you'll have some time to talk to me. I have something I need to tell you. Catherine's voice was matter-of-fact, and she didn't look up until her sentence was over, almost as though she didn't want to see his reaction. You can't tell me now? He asked lifting his hands and looking around the room. If they shut the door, the office was private. I can, but I would prefer to wait until we have privacy and aren't at work. Even though Catherine and he had worked together for more than a decade, since before they had gotten out of high school, really, he didn't always understand her. After all, she was a female, and females baffled him, as his long and storied dating history obviously showed. Maybe that's what the disquiet was, that subtle annoyance. Whether it was because he wanted a family or because he felt like maybe there was a part of his life where he'd been a failure since he'd been unable to find a life partner, he wasn't exactly sure. Not that his brothers had been any more successful. Braxton was the only one who was married, and although Krista was living in Iowa now, no one would really consider Braxton's marriage successful. At least, not the first part of it. Braxton seemed to be doing a good job of turning everything around. Maybe that's what was making him antsy. Seeing Braxton conquer the whole matching up and getting married thing made him want to try again. As he shuffled through the papers on his desk, he tried to put those thoughts out of his mind. Prairie Rose wasn't exactly a hotbed of available single women, not to mention he'd already dated most of them, unsuccessfully. He was too serious, too unemotional, too analytical, too literal, too driven, too involved in his work, too unable to figure out what in the Sam Hill a woman wanted and how to keep her happy. He hadn't ever been in a relationship where he hadn't felt like a puppet on a string, constantly trying to dance to whatever tune the woman was playing and feeling completely clueless and totally unable to figure even the simplest things out. He'd had a couple relationships that lasted longer than a year, but that was probably more because neither he nor the woman that he was with wanted to break things off, not because they were so madly in love with each other that they couldn't bear to. Maybe that was his problem. He was too unemotional to fall in love. Not that he'd ever heard of anybody with such a problem, but really, that almost had to be it. It wasn't a problem he was going to solve today, though, so he paused while sorting papers on his desk and looked over at Catherine. When Neil comes back in, you want to go out and eat lunch? She looked up. And maybe it was just this weird feeling he'd been having. But she seemed almost preoccupied, or maybe concerned. But she nodded as he'd expected her to. In fact, 
he didn't typically even ask. Just when everyone else had eaten, they grabbed their lunch and went together. In the winter, they'd usually eat in the office with the door closed. Nothing new, nothing exciting. Catherine was as dependable as an old metal wheel tractor. She was the one thing in his life he didn't have to worry about. Chapter 2 Catherine stood at the sink paring potatoes, listening with half an ear as Graham talked about the Ladies' Corn Society and the festival that Prairie Rose was getting ready to have. Prairie Rose had their festival this coming week, but the bigger festival that she and Elias were taking Arian to was the week after. She nodded and laughed at the right places, but she was thankful for the potato in her hand, because otherwise her fingers might be shaking. You seem kind of quiet. Graham turned the water on in the sink and rinsed the flour off her fingers. Is something bothering you? Her voice was considerate and kind, as it always was. Graham wasn't really her Graham. She was Elias's grandmother. The town called her Miss Matilda, but Catherine had quit calling her that years ago and settled on Graham. She and Elias had been... friends? She supposed they were friends. He'd probably consider them friends. But for a while, she had wanted to be more pretty much the whole time they'd known each other. He'd gone through girlfriends, and each time she'd bite her nails to the quick, wondering if his current girl was the one he'd end up with. Never had been, and she'd wondered why she'd been so scared. What would she be losing if she lost Elias? That had been a question she'd been considering the entire summer. Have you ever known you need to make a decision, but you're kind of stuck the way you are, and you enjoy it, but you wish it would be more, and you know it won't ever be, and so you know you need to make the decision, but you just keep putting it off? She figured she'd been sufficiently broad and vague and also confusing, and Graham would have no idea what she was talking about. Maybe she'd be confused and they could laugh it off as a joke. She tried to think of how to turn it so Graham wouldn't know what she had really wanted to say. But Graham surprised her. You want to quit working with Elias? Her head snapped around, and thankfully, her fingers stopped at the same time. The last thing she needed to do was cut herself and bleed all over the potatoes she was holding. Was I that obvious? I thought I was being very tricky with my answer. Graham chuckled. I have wondered for years how long it was going to take you to want to move out of whatever rut you guys are in. I guess now I know. Has he said something? If Elias wanted to stop working with her, he'd certainly been very vague about saying so. No. Good. I'd hate to think he was forcing himself to work with me all these years and didn't really want to. The way you've been doing with him? Graham asked, causing Catherine to shake her head. No, I haven't been forcing myself to work with him. I enjoy it. And that was true. It was also true that Elias took advantage of her. Her friends had pointed it out at different times, some of them pushing her to do something about it. But was he taking advantage of her if she didn't mind? Elias and she had started out on equal footing in high school when they'd gone into business cleaning houses, of all things. They'd just wanted to earn money, and they'd done it during the summer, doubling up his work on the farm so they'd have time to do their side jobs, cleaning out attics, basements, and even garages doing handiwork around town that older people couldn't do and business people were too busy for. When they graduated from high school, their friends had all gone off to college, but both of them had wanted to start their own businesses right away. She'd jumped on an opportunity to be a representative for a big-name machinery company, selling equipment off their lots. She didn't have to have inventory, and she hadn't had to do anything other than be able to make her own website. 
It had been simple at first, but evolved over the years, and now it was pretty good if she did say so herself. Elias had come up with a similar idea because at the time, they'd still wanted to work together. He'd opened up a brick-and-mortar store and carried smaller equipment, teaching himself how to fix it. Soon, she had directed to Elias all the warranty work that her customers needed done. She supposed a person could say she was the reason Elias had been successful. Sometimes she thought that way, but most of the time, she believed that Elias would have been successful no matter what. But the way it played out made it look like she had helped him. Graham put a piece of liver in the hot butter in the skillet, and the sizzle broke through her thoughts. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, Graham said, dipping another piece of liver in the flour mixture she had on a plate, making sure it was coated evenly. I guess I don't know what to say. I wasn't expecting you to guess, but I was planning on talking to him about it tonight. Do you have something else in mind? My Aunt Lenore is having a hip replacement, and she and Uncle Penn could really use someone to stay with them and help them. She paused, unsure. I've considered moving there permanently. What about your business? Graham asked, knowing what Catherine and Elias did. There wasn't too much about Catherine that Graham didn't know. I think I'm going to sell it. I actually had someone reach out a couple of weeks ago, and I dismissed it. But after Aunt Lenore mentioned her hip replacement, and that they were thinking about hiring a personal aide because none of their children are interested in helping, I thought that maybe that's something I should do. Family should take care of each other, shouldn't they? I most definitely agree about that. Too many families are split and split again, and if they're not split, they're too busy taking care of themselves to be bothered with anyone else. Graham's words didn't sound bitter exactly because her family had taken very good care of her. But Catherine knew that many of her friends had been shoved into a home by their children against their will, just because that was the easiest solution. Their children didn't want to be bothered. It had been hard for Graham to watch, although she hadn't talked much about it. I know. Aunt Lenore kept me when Dad and my brothers went off for harvest every year. I have a lot of great memories with her. Her dad and mom had divorced when she was small, and Aunt Lenore had been almost like a mom, even if her own children were much older than Catherine. Are you still helping your dad to coordinate repairs with Elias? Graham asked as she put the last piece of liver in the skillet. I have been, but he's been hinting that he'd like Melinda to take over, Catherine said mentioning her stepmom, who seemed like a nice enough person, although she barely talked to her. Her birth mom hadn't been in her life much, although since she'd become an adult, she had a casual friendship with her. Nothing close. It had been odd to see her dad find someone, and she'd been happy at first, but she had to admit to a little disappointment that Melinda didn't seem interested in anything but taking over Catherine's part of the business. She already felt left out since her five older brothers all helped their dad on the harvest crew, and she'd never gone along, even to cook. But she wouldn't have the business she had now, and she wouldn't have worked with Elias all these years if things had been different so she could hardly hope or wish for her past to be changed. Not that it did any good to wish for something like that. Are you feeling pushed out? Graham asked, scraping the last of the flour out of the bowl and shaking it over the liver frying in the skillet. I guess, but it's a good thing, isn't it? So many times, God moves in our lives and we don't see it. We just push back against the change and don't realize it's for our benefit. That's wise, Graham said with a smile. That's exactly what I was going to say. That maybe this change might not be what you want, might make you sad, but it might be opening the door for something else. 
Yeah, that's what I meant to say, only far less eloquently. I've been accused of many things in my lifetime, but eloquence is not one of them. You said it better than I did. So you want to sell your business and give up what you do with your family and go be a personal care aide? Well, I have quite a bit of money set back, and I also have the rental income from the storage units I own. I don't need a million bucks to tide me over every month. I mean, maybe it would be fun to live on a farm, but I don't want to do it by myself. And I'm happy with my little house on the edge of town. So I was thinking I would just help Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn, and then when they're back on their feet, I might find something cute and cozy near them. Once I'm settled down there, maybe something else will present itself. Maybe you could work on that interior design business you've always been interested in when you were younger. Maybe. Catherine lifted her shoulder. She loved designing things, and she had always wanted to do interior design. But it had gotten pushed aside for other things. You know, when you look back at your life, you don't want to say to yourself, I wish I'd done that. That seems to me like one of those things you might say. I suppose. Catherine turned the water on and rinsed the potato off before shutting the water back off and cutting it into small pieces into the pot on the stove. She really didn't think she would regret not being in interior design but she was almost positive she would regret not having children. I want a family, she blurted out without even really thinking about it. That's the one thing I'll look back on and regret, not having one. Chapter 3 Graham's hands stilled before she continued adding a little water to the liver. I see. And you think you might find a family as a personal aid to Aunt Lenore? Catherine huffed a laugh, knowing that Graham was just pointing out the obvious, that her actions weren't exactly leading her toward what she really wanted out of life. No, I know it won't specifically. I just, I just think I've wasted enough time, spent enough time, not wasted, working with Elias. And that's never going to go anywhere, Graham said knowingly. It caused Catherine's head to jerk toward her, but Graham was looking at the pieces of liver as she worked them loose from the bottom of the pan and flipped them. Yeah, I'm facing it, and I'm moving out of it, so maybe it's not too late, and something else will open up. Graham didn't say anything and just kind of hummed under her breath. It wasn't the sound, necessarily, that made Catherine stop as she chopped up the last potato. It was more the tone. What did you mean by never going anywhere? She finally asked, truly perplexed. Graham opened her mouth, holding her fork above the liver. Then she closed it and shook her head. I don't know. I guess I see things sometimes, and I want to say things. But sometimes it's just best to let the Lord work things out rather than me meddling. Maybe I want you to meddle? Catherine said, meaning it. Graham had so much wisdom, and it had helped her so much over the years. She would take any advice Graham wanted to give. She certainly was interested in Graham's perspective. Sometimes I think that Elias has taken advantage of you. In fact, I know it. I know. People have told me that for years. I don't see it that way. And I don't usually see it that way either. Not really. Except, it's not that he's taken advantage of you so much as he just doesn't appreciate you. Does that make more sense? Catherine was quiet for a moment, chewing on that. Finally, she nodded. I think that's what my problem is. I kind of just feel like I'm there, invisible. But he leans on me so much and just never really realizes that I do anything, even though he expects it. 
you two almost act like an old married couple. A couple that's forgotten to appreciate what they love about each other and just take each other for granted. Graham spread sliced onions over top of the cooking liver. I've seen so much of that in my life. You don't really realize what you have until it's gone. People can be so dumb sometimes. I can't disagree with that. I certainly have done my share of dumb things over the years. But not appreciating the people around you is one of the dumbest. And we have a tendency to do that with people who are closest to us, our family and friends. We let the things they do that irritate us come to the forefront, and we forget to thank them and appreciate them for the positive things that they do. Catherine's first instinct was to jump on this and say that's exactly what Elias did. But as she rolled it over in her head, she realized that she did the same thing to him. He showed up for work every morning, and she just assumed he was going to. She could overbook his schedule, and he never complained about it. Just found people to do the work or did it himself if he ran out of employees. He made sure she was never alone while she was eating her lunch. Little things that she hadn't thought about. Maybe she was discontented with him, but maybe part of that was her own fault. Don't go blaming yourself, Graham said as though she could read her mind. It's human nature and something everyone does. Also, you can't go around every day thanking people for getting up in the morning or for breathing or even thanking them for the little things they do every day. Pretty soon, your thanks get old, and people take that for granted. Man, it smells good in here. Elias's voice came from the doorway. I see you ladies left the table setting to me. You have to do something to earn your supper, Graham said with a tease in her voice as she lifted the lid off of the liver and carefully forked the pieces, picking them up and letting the onion shift to the bottom. Is it just me tonight? Elias asked as he opened the silverware drawer and pulled utensils out. Keen should be showing up soon, Graham said. But Preston is fixing a broken feeder in one of your chicken barns, and Krista wanted to get the living room painted. She's eight months pregnant. She shouldn't be painting. Those fumes aren't good for her. Braxton's probably painting, Catherine said over her shoulder, confident that she was right. But Krista's nesting, and Braxton's paying for it. She exchanged a grin with Graham. Nesting? Elias said with his hands poised above the silverware drawer. It's something that happens to pregnant women right before they have their babies, although I think some women have issues with it their entire pregnancy. Catherine didn't know this from personal experience, but her friend Carmen had three children, and Carmen had definitely done her share of nesting. I guess I'll take that from the expert, Elias said with more than a little tease in his voice. Since you've had so many children and most definitely know all about pregnancy. Well, I have friends who have been pregnant, which is more than you've had. I hope anyway, Catherine said, stirring the potatoes as they came to a boil. Before Elias could respond, the side door opened and Keen walked in. Something smells good in here, he sniffed appreciatively as he closed the door behind him. I was starting to think you weren't going to make it, Graham said as she put the lid back on the liver and onions and turned from the stove. Arian wanted me to take a book back to the library for her. Keen shrugged his shoulders and grabbed a carrot out of the pan that sat on the stove beside the potatoes. Catherine lightly swatted his hand. You're the only person I know that would walk by the plate of cookies sitting right there by the door and steal a carrot. Makes me think you steal just for the sake of stealing. She'd practically grown up with Keen, who was two years younger than Elias and the baby of the Emerson family. All of the brothers were like brothers to her, but she wasn't as close to Braxton and Preston as she was to Keen and Elias. Elias was even closer than a brother. She wasn't sure what that made him, but she could almost think his thoughts for him. Twins, maybe? 
I wouldn't have taken it if I had known it was going to taste like that, Keen said, making faces as he chewed the carrot he'd popped in his mouth. That's because I haven't put the sugar in them yet. Graham grabbed the bag of brown sugar that was sitting on the other side of the stove and handed it to him. Go ahead and do that for me. The whole bag, right? Keen said, and Catherine was pretty sure he wasn't joking. That's right, Elias said from behind them, setting another plate on the table. You can never have too much sugar. If he puts the whole bag of sugar in that tiny pan of carrots, you will not be able to eat it. Catherine said, stirring the potatoes one more time before she walked to the cupboard and pulled out the mixer, grabbing the beaters from the drawer. I'm pretty sure that was a challenge. Accept it, Keen said, and Catherine had to shake her head. He was way too old to be doing crazy stuff like that, but she figured Keen was probably also physically incapable of turning down a challenge. Graham handed Keen a measuring spoon. Put three of these in, and that will make it sweet enough that you won't need dessert. And this, Catherine said as she handed him a small slab of butter. I think I just got suckered into helping. I'm not sure how that happened. If you're not careful, they'll have you doing the dishes next. Elias came and stood looking over his brother's shoulder as though supervising the sugar. Catherine wouldn't put it past him in his younger days to make sure that the entire bag got dumped in. She was pretty sure he was past that point in his life, though. Pretty sure. Arian has you at the library a good bit. Elias's hands were on his hips, and his eyes were on the sugar bag as Keen dug into it, scooping and pulling out a heaping spoonful. Catherine grinned to herself but didn't say anything as he dumped the whole thing in and went in for another one. Knowing Graham, she had meant to have the exact amount that Keen would end up putting in, and had probably halved it just because she knew he would do what he was doing now. The lady was shrewd, and the boys didn't get too much past her. I think she has it in her head that somehow Gertie and I are going to get together. I hate to burst her bubble. Keen scooped in the bag again, pulling out another heaping spoonful of sugar and doing the same thing. Gertie seems nice enough. I mean, I've never actually talked to her, and I'm pretty sure nobody in Prairie Rose ever has either. Not for lack of trying, but just because Gertie doesn't seem to talk to anyone. But hey, I'm pretty sure if she ever talks, she would be nice. Elias grabbed the container of potatoes as Catherine snapped off the burner and took it to the sink where she had set the colander out, carefully pouring most of the water out. They'd made mashed potatoes together so often they didn't need to talk about it. Elias always insisted on carrying the pan if he was in the kitchen, like she didn't do it when he wasn't. It always made her shake her head, but she appreciated the consideration. Elias wasn't exactly known for that character trait, and when he displayed it, she figured she ought to appreciate it. I went to school with her, sat next to her through 13 years of imprisonment, and I've never talked to her. That's saying something. Boy, I'll say, the person who can resist your charm for 13 years must be quite the stoic. Elias smirked as he tipped the potatoes back up, shook the pan to get them to settle, and held it still while Catherine slid the chopped up pieces of butter into the pan. That's how I feel about it. If anything were ever going to happen between us, it would have happened then. It didn't, so Arian is wasting her time, but if it makes her happy, I'll take her books back to the library. Arian might have something going on. I wouldn't dismiss her that easily. Catherine said as she put the mixer into the pan of potatoes that Elias had set on the hot pad on the counter. She turned the mixer on, and no one talked over it as Keen stirred the carrots and Elias helped Graham plate the liver and onions, pouring the gravy from them into a bowl. I agree with Catherine. Arian is pretty astute. I know she's a child, but she has a perspective that you don't. That's always valuable, even if you might not agree with it. Graham carried the plate of liver to the table and set it down, 
while Elias grabbed a handful of salt from the salt container and threw it over the potatoes. Catherine turned the mixer back on and mixed the salt in before stopping the mixer and ejecting the beaters. Elias grabbed the potatoes and set them on the table, while Catherine wiped the mixer off and put it away. I agree with you in theory, but I still say that it's going to be really hard to have a relationship with someone who's never spoken a word to you before in your life, despite the fact that you sat beside them every day for 13 years. Keen had finished stirring the carrots and popped three more in his mouth before he carried them to the table. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with her? Catherine asked, knowing he was exaggerating just a little. She had talked to Gertie at the library plenty of times and found her to be sweet, if a little quiet. Okay, you're right. I don't know how many times our conversation started out with, move your book so I can put my elbow on your desk, and I don't know why, but instead of answering me, she swatted at my arm and held her book exactly where I didn't want it. I guess I should add not willing to move on top of not willing to talk. With all the food on the table, they sat down, and Graham looked at Elias. Say the blessing, please. Catherine bowed her head and closed her eyes and listened to Elias's familiar rumble as he spoke to the Lord. She had never expected him to be perfect. She hoped he hadn't expected the same out of her. Sure, Graham was probably right that he took advantage of her, as she had certainly done to him. When two people were as close as what they were, it was bound to happen. But the relationship had never progressed to beyond friendship, not to affection or anything even remotely resembling romance. For years, she hoped it would, and finally, a few years ago, she'd given up. She didn't give up easily, so that was saying something. Still, Hearing him talk to the Lord gave her a little thrill, while at the same time it made her heart sad. He'd find someone else to sit at the table with and share suppers with and raise a family with, and someone else would get to hear that voice rumble over their evening meal, saying the blessing and asking God's protection and provision for their family. She'd given up on that, even if she did still kind of long for it. Amen. Elias said, and they all repeated it before they reached for whatever bowl was sitting right in front of them. The conversation went on as normal around them, with some laughter, family news, town news, and festival talk. Catherine participated while, in the back of her head, she was mentally steeling herself to deliver the news that she had to deliver to Elias after they were done eating. She kind of felt like he would be okay with it. He might even be relieved. He certainly wasn't going to say that he was going to miss her and beg her to stay, although if he did, she was almost certain that she would do it. Maybe part of her longed to know that he really wanted her and not to just guess and assume. Maybe part of her hoped that her saying that she was going to leave would jolt him into realizing how much he depended on her, liked her, needed her. But she doubted it. And if that were the only reason, she definitely wouldn't do it, no matter how much she wanted to see if he would admit to missing her. She truly felt like this was the best thing for her to do, even if she really didn't want to. It was time for her to move on, and the reason she was stealing herself was so that she wouldn't be too hurt when he didn't have a reaction other than a shrug of his shoulders and a see-you-around-like-a-donut comment. Chapter 4 Elias held the door open while Catherine walked out. The dishes were all cleaned up and put away, and Graham had made up a plate of leftovers, giving it to them to take to her neighbor across the street. Keene had left several minutes before, since not only had Arian given him a book to take back to the library, but she'd given him a list of books she needed him to check out for her, and he wanted to get them home to her. As they walked out, he could hear Graham talking on the phone to one of the ladies on the Corn Festival board. There was a lot of work that went into putting on a festival, 
and Graham was right in the middle of it. I hope I'm as active as she is when I'm that age, Catherine said as she waited at the bottom of the steps for him to catch up. She's quite a woman, that's for sure. I'm not sure I've ever seen her stop. Me either, Catherine said, seeming thoughtful. She had seemed quiet all evening, come to think of it. Not that he usually thought about how she was. But he supposed if he were doing so, he'd have to say she seemed a little quiet during the day as well. And the idea that she had something she wanted to talk to him about came back, pinching at his insides and making him wonder if it might be a little more important than what he thought it was. Typically, he didn't spend too much time thinking about what people might be going to do. It seemed like there were a lot more important things in the world, but he'd also been accused of being inconsiderate and clueless. Someone, he couldn't remember who, but it might have been Catherine, probably was, had suggested that maybe he should start thinking about those kind of things at least a little. It might help with his inconsideration and cluelessness. He figured it was just a man thing. Weren't men known for being inconsiderate and clueless? He was just doing what males all over the world did. It's a beautiful night, he said as they strolled along the sidewalk and across the sleepy street. It is. There aren't too many more of these left before cold weather sets in for good. I'm grateful for the reprieve. Catherine stepped up on the sidewalk on the other side of the street beside him, and they took a few steps before turning and stepping up onto Mr. Brunswick's front porch. Catherine waited while he knocked on the door. Mr. Brunswick answered, and they chatted for a bit, with Mr. Brunswick being very appreciative of the covered plate that Graham had sent. Less than five minutes later, they stepped down off the porch, and Elias said, as casually as he could, you had something you wanted to talk to me about? Catherine huffed out a breath. I'm surprised you remembered. He had to admit that she was right. He typically didn't pay a lot of attention to conversations and often forgot details Catherine seemed to easily remember. They made a great team that way. He remembered the details of the equipment, the things that typically went wrong, and the approximate cost of fixing them while Catherine remembered people. She remembered when someone's father had died or when someone had their arm injured in a farming accident, or when the weather in their area of the country had been dry or wet, or if they'd had a late frost. When they put their two strengths together, him with the equipment and all of the information regarding the running of it and the fixing of it, and Catherine's ability to remember what happened to people and what they liked and wanted and had gone through, they made a great team. Funny, he'd never noticed that before. He couldn't believe he noticed it now. Maybe he was more scared than he thought about what Catherine wanted to talk about. It's not something you usually say, and it's really odd that you want to do it outside of the office. I guess I'm curious. She nodded her head up the street, to the small park beside the ice cream store, which was closed even though it was warm for late October. Summer hours were over, and winter hours were in effect all through Prairie Rose. You want to sit up there on a bench? There's not enough privacy? He admitted his words were a little sarcastic. If they couldn't sit and talk in their office with the door closed, the park bench certainly wasn't more private. We'll be able to see if anyone comes, Catherine said rather than taking the bait and responding to his sarcasm. He definitely noticed that. Catherine and he weren't exactly the kind of people who laughed and joked all the time. But when he was being sarcastic or rude, Catherine wasn't afraid to call him on it. The fact that she hadn't didn't bode well for whatever she had to say, in his opinion. She settled on the bench, but he was too restless to sit down and so he propped his foot on the seat, leaning an arm on his leg and looking out across the cornfields that were visible on the other side of the playground. Bare and brown, the corn had been harvested, the stalks chopped, and a cover crop planted. 
rye most likely, which was what Mr. Thompson typically planted. We've worked together for a long time, Catherine started, and Elias's heart stilled. He hadn't been sure what the subject of her conversation was going to be, but he didn't like the start of this one. That's true, we have. We make a good team. Her head jerked up at that, and her eyes widened. I didn't realize you thought that. Even with someone else, he wouldn't have tried to bluff his way through and pretend that he'd been thinking it all along. He was a terrible liar, and even worse at flattery, and she'd see right through it in an instant. So he said, I guess I just realized it tonight. She stared at him for a second or two before her lips flattened and turned up almost in a smile that said that's exactly what she thought, or she wasn't as surprised as what she'd originally been. He almost wished he would have tried to bluff his way through and pretend that he'd been thinking that all along. Not sure why. Impressing Catherine wasn't exactly on his list of things to do. She knew him too well for him to be able to pull the wool over her eyes for long. And it had been years, more than a decade maybe, since he'd really thought about caring about what she thought about him. He supposed he would just assumed she liked him and thought good thoughts. That expression, it was almost as though she wasn't expecting much out of him and had been surprised that he might be more and then realized that she'd been wrong about thinking he'd been more than what he was. His mind never went in directions like that. It was so odd that all of the sudden today he was thinking along those lines. I've disappointed you. He might as well state the obvious. No, I just thought maybe you were exceeding my expectations and you didn't. She sounded disappointed but he didn't argue with her. Men just don't think like that, he finally said. I guess. Her tone said that maybe some men did, or it said that maybe it wasn't a natural thing, but it was unfair to use his gender to excuse inconsideration. Didn't women use their gender all the time to excuse their emotionality? Why couldn't he? My Aunt Lenore is having hip replacement surgery in two weeks. That's good. She's getting it in before Thanksgiving. He wasn't sure what her Aunt Lenore had to do with this conversation, although he did know her. Catherine was quite fond of her. It's not high risk or anything, right? People have hip replacements all the time and do fine. Surely she wasn't worried about it. Although, as he recalled, her Aunt Lenore was like a mother to her. He'd spent some time with Catherine at her Aunt Lenore's house growing up. She should be fine, but she will need some care when she gets home, and she doesn't want to go to a facility. She wants to recuperate at home. I don't blame her. Home is the best place to be, always. He missed the farmhouse he'd grown up in, but he loved the privacy of the house on the edge of town that he'd bought just about the time other kids his age were graduating from college. That's how well his business had done. I want to help her. Catherine stared at her hands, almost as though she were afraid to look at his face, which was odd since Catherine wasn't afraid of him. They were too comfortable with each other for there to be fear between them. Although, Catherine wasn't acting comfortable now. I think you should. You want me to help her, too? He still wasn't sure exactly where she was going with this conversation. No, I can handle it. Especially since... Her face came up, and she looked him in the eye. A couple of weeks ago, someone contacted me, interested in buying my business. At the time, I thought that was crazy and wasn't the slightest bit interested in it. But after I got to thinking about it, and remembering Aunt Lenore's surgery, and the things that I'd wanted to do and how the business takes up all my time, I guess I just was thinking that it might not be such a bad idea after all. Selling your business? Elias couldn't believe his tone sounded so level, 
especially since his insides felt like he'd been poked with a steel rod. He even had trouble breathing, like someone had smacked his chest with one as well. Catherine was thinking about selling her business? She wouldn't be in the office with him anymore. He wouldn't look over at her desk and see her biting the end of whatever pen she'd chosen to use for the day. She wouldn't overbook the shop, then grab a quick supper and sit in the bay with him while he worked late, finishing the work she'd promised would be done. What about the warranty work he always did for all her customers? She wouldn't send her dad's harvest crew repairs to him. Catherine always coordinated the repairs and scheduled them with him. He might not lose all that business, but Catherine was responsible for a good bit of it. Chapter 5 So you'd sell it to him and you'd work for him instead of owning the business? Elias asked. That was stupid. It wasn't even conceivable, but he couldn't think of anything else. No, I would sell the business and I would be gone, completely out of it. Catherine returned, confident in her words. What about... What about me? It sounded selfish. After he'd said it, he could hear that. But that wasn't really what his concern was. They did things together. It wasn't just him, although he liked to be proud of his accomplishments. Maybe a little too proud. After all, Catherine had been involved in everything. If it hadn't been for her, he wouldn't have what he had right now. He didn't usually tell her that. Maybe it was a little bit of competitiveness. She was his friend, and he felt mostly protective of her, and he absolutely liked her. But he supposed there was always a little bit of competition in his head. He liked to win. He liked to be the best. He wanted to be better than her, not in a mean way, but in a way that maybe so she could admire him because he'd done so well. Not just her, but everyone. He wanted that admiration. Maybe he hadn't said to her how much he appreciated her, partly because he didn't. He never really thought about how much she did. He hated to think that about himself and hoped it wasn't true, but the thought was there. That's why we're talking. I'm concerned about you. I want the best for you, and I don't want you to think that I'm just dropping you. We've worked together for a long time. There she was being considerate again. He always benefited from her consideration, and people complained that it was something he lacked. So he supposed, in their relationship, he benefited from hers, and she didn't get the same benefits. It wasn't that he didn't want to be considerate, it just wasn't something he was good at. It's not something you've worked on either, a voice said in his head. True, very true, and he couldn't deny it. He could give an excuse. He wasn't good at it. He was a man. He didn't have time. He let Catherine do it, and he worked on what he was good at. All those excuses that really didn't hold water. Basically, he hadn't considered it important to work on being considerate. It was hard, and he didn't want to. That was the reason. I appreciate it, but you need to do what's best for you. So if you're going to sell your business, that's you. I'll deal with whatever I have to deal with. He dropped his foot from the park bench, annoyed even though she'd been as considerate as she could be. Sometimes Catherine was a little too perfect, too good, too everything. And while he admired that and looked up to that and would like to be like her, it irritated him and made him want to put distance between them because the better she was, the worse he looked beside her. I was afraid you'd be upset. That's why I didn't want to talk about it while we were working. It wasn't that we didn't have enough privacy in the office. I just didn't want to ruin the rest of your workday. Her eyes went back down to her hands, 
and they fidgeted in her lap. He blew out a breath and turned his head away. Figures. There she was again, being considerate. He shouldn't be annoyed, and he definitely wasn't surprised. I'm not upset. It was a lie, but he wanted it to be true. He didn't want to admit how bothered he was by the fact that she was just going to walk away. I don't have to do it. I really want to help Aunt Lenore, but I don't have to sell the business. I just, I just feel I need to move on. Don't let me stop you. Please, I don't want it to be like this. I wanted to have an amicable parting, or no parting at all. I'm not angry. We're not fighting. If you need to go, go. That's what you need to do. I'll figure something out. Forget it, Catherine stood. Just forget it. I can't stand the idea that there might be anything between us other than goodwill. In all the years that we've worked together, I don't think we fought one time. We haven't. We're not fighting now. I'm just surprised. I'm sorry I'm not handling this exactly the way you think I should. Her eyes flew to his, and there was hurt there. His words were uncalled for. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it in an unkind way. I guess you just took me by surprise. Give me a few minutes to figure this out, to get used to the idea, and everything will be fine. I do want the best for you, and I want you to do what you want to do. If that isn't running a business and working with me anymore, then that's what you need to do. And I don't want to hold you back from moving on. He lifted his cowboy hat and ran a hand through his hair before settling it back on his head. He could do this. Sure, he got at least half of his business from Catherine. More than half. Seventy percent. But he'd still get that after she quit. It wasn't the business that bothered him. It was the fact that Catherine wouldn't be there. He could hardly picture working without her. Really, he never had. He wanted to ask how things were going to change when she left, in order to cover the fact that he could hardly stand the idea that she wouldn't be with them in their office anymore. But she probably didn't know. And this wasn't the time to talk business. They'd have to sit down and go over it. Maybe we can make time to figure these things out, so I know what I'm looking at. That's just it. The people that approached me do not have their own shop. They'll definitely want you to do their warranty work. I wouldn't do it any other way. I've already told you that my stepmother wants to take over the books for Dad's business. She'll be arranging the repairs. I'm guessing that she'll be taking on everything that I was doing with his friends as well. Although she hasn't said. I told Dad it was fine with me as long as you still got their business. Me leaving won't change any of that. But that wasn't exactly a paid position. It was just something I did. Something she did and something he'd taken advantage of. His lips pressed together. He didn't like the words taken advantage of being applied to him, and especially to something he had done to Catherine. As perfect as she was, she had her faults and she'd overcome more than a little hardship with her dad basically neglecting her in favor of running his business with her older brothers. She'd lost her mom at a young age, and he'd been her one true friend. What a friend. Far more concerned about himself than anyone else. He needed to be a friend now. Stuffing down the churning emotions that beat against his ribs and clawed at the back of his throat, he sat down on the bench and did something he couldn't ever remember doing. He put his hand on Catherine's wrist and slid it up between her two clasped hands. Her body froze, just for a second, before she allowed his hand to split hers, and he grasped her fingers with his. I'm sorry. My reaction could have been a lot better. If I look back over the years of our friendship and our business partnership, 
You've always thought of me first. Ahead of yourself, ahead of your comfort, even ahead of your financial success. The thing is, you and I are probably the only ones who know that. Everyone else looks at me and sees this successful businessman, but they don't understand that it's been us, together. You on one side of the office and me on the other. I'm sorry I've not been more appreciative and haven't been more vocal about what you've done for me and what it means to me. He didn't typically talk like that. It was far more emotional than what he was comfortable with, but it was the right thing to do and say. He hadn't handled it well, and the fact that she was even considering not doing what she wanted just to keep him happy made guilt push and pull in uncomfortable ways. Chapter 6 Catherine didn't say anything. Maybe Elias had shocked her. Probably he had. She'd never heard him say anything like that before. Come to think of it, he probably shouldn't be just saying it to her. He should be letting the world know it. After all, it really didn't matter what he said between them if he acted like something else in front of everyone else. He supposed he didn't blame her for keeping her head down. She seemed to be staring at their hands together, and the sight caught his eyes too. Catherine wasn't stereotypically beautiful, but she was funny and kind and definitely thoughtful. And while he hadn't exactly thought that they made a great team over the years, that idea solidified in his head now. He had actually considered asking her out multiple times. They got along well, and she didn't get upset at his bumbling inconsideration and his drive and total interest in his work and family and farm. Somehow, he hadn't put her off like he put off every other woman he'd ever tried to date. Except, now it seemed like he had. And she'd just never said anything. Maybe it didn't count, though, since she'd stayed with him. Through the years, I'm sure I've been inconsiderate. People tell me that all the time. She laughed, maybe just a grunt, but still humor. You don't have to agree with me. To disagree would be to lie. You don't have to be so brutally honest, either. Sorry. Forgiven. His humor matched hers. He thought they'd understood each other, if he'd ever thought about it. Maybe he had been exactly what she thought he was. This is something you've been thinking about for a while? She nodded. Not because you're inconsiderate. That's just part of who you are. Sure, sometimes I thought it would be nice to have someone think about me the way I think about other people. Or it would be nice if you noticed something and said something about it. I can't deny that those thoughts haven't gone through my head. She lifted her brow and sighed. But no, this isn't a, I'm fed up with you and I can't wait to get away from you, if that's what you're asking. I guess it kind of was. I thought about my track record and the... I guess I was thinking about the girls I've dated. Not you, obviously, since we never did. But you're just the one who's put up with me the longest. And I wondered if this was similar to what the other girls said when they broke up with me. Again, not that I can sit comparing our relationship to a romantic relationship. Of course not. Catherine said, but her tone made his head jerk over. Was that sarcasm in her voice? What do you mean by that? He asked, studying her. She swallowed before she lifted her head, her eyes clear, her face open. Nothing. Just that our relationship isn't a romantic relationship, and I'm not breaking up with you. I want to stay friends. Maybe we'll even work together again. Her eyes smiled, although there was still a bit of sadness on her face. 
but it has everything to do with God seeming to move things around. Aunt Lenore having her hip replacement, Uncle Penn being too crippled up himself to help with her, and that all coupled with the person contacting me and asking to buy my business. And then I got thinking about all the things I wanted to do. It's really not you. She looked into his eyes as she said those last words and nodded her head as though emphasizing them. Catherine had always been honest. Elias had never wondered for a moment whether she were being honest with him. He trusted her with everything, including his passwords, bank accounts, and his business, basically. There wasn't anything that he had that he didn't trust her with. He would trust her now. I believe you, he said simply. She smiled, not a smile of surprise, not a smile of triumph either just a smile that said she figured he would and was glad he did. Have you made a deal with this person that's been in contact with you? He asked, his eyes back on their hands, their fingers. Without him really thinking about it, his other hand had gone over and traced the lines of her fingers against his. They were so much smaller, more delicate. His were brown, bigger, stronger, working hands. No, I wouldn't do that to you. I see. So then you don't have a definite timeline. Do you know how much longer you might be working? Aunt Lenore's operation is in two weeks. I'd really like to be out of the office by then, even if the business isn't sold. Two weeks? Wow. I'm not leaving you. I'm not selling my house in Prairie Rose. Not now, anyway. I hadn't even thought you'd consider it. She thought about that, too. Have you? Sure. I mean, come on. I'm in my 30s. I want a family. I guess you could say my biological clock is ticking, right? There really is such a thing, I suppose. Because that's probably driving my decision, too. Prairie Rose has been a dead end for me. If I want a husband and children, the farm and family that I've always kind of, in the back of my head, thought I would have, I need to go get it. It's not been coming to me. I didn't realize you wanted that. He would have thought that the idea of her leaving him, leaving his business, separating hers from his and moving on, would have been the biggest blow she could have dealt him. But her words had left his head feeling like it was spinning like an airplane out of control, falling from the sky, and all he could see was the ground rushing up to meet him faster than he could think. Don't you? I hadn't thought about it. The truth. The honest truth. Except he had that little longing. The idea that maybe there wasn't something quite right about his life, even though everything that he'd wanted had been accomplished. And now, in just the space of a few minutes, Catherine had pulled the rug out from under everything and turned everything that he thought he was content with on its head. The idea of working without her? Unthinkable. The idea of her not just leaving, but leaving Prairie Rose? Crazy. The idea of Catherine with a husband and children. A husband that wasn't him. Children that weren't his. Honestly, he'd never even thought about Catherine with children. He'd certainly never thought about him as her husband. But he hadn't thought of anyone else as her husband either. You never even dated. Not much, anyway. He laughed a little. There was that one date with Gator Franks. Pretty sure you slapped his face and walked home from the Rosalie Festival, with him following you in his car the entire way, begging you to forgive him, if I recall correctly. <laughs> that sounds about right, Catherine said with a grin. That was a long time ago, and you're right, I haven't dated much. 
She left it at that, and he didn't say anything else either. Wandering back through his mind, finding it easier than he would have thought to remember each time she'd gone out with someone. Just one time with each for the most part, never anything long term. And each time, he'd been on edge. Even when he'd had a girlfriend of his own, he'd been on edge, and he attributed it to him being concerned about Catherine's safety and well-being, that she was his business partner, a friend, someone he cared about. Of course he cared about her health and well-being. So, all of a sudden, you've decided you want a family? He asked, and his words were a little hesitant, wanting to figure out something, even if he wasn't sure what. It hasn't been all of a sudden. I've just been gradually realizing that if I want it, I'm going to have to go find it somewhere else. She'd said something very similar just a bit ago, and he wondered exactly what she meant by somewhere else. Like she'd been hoping to find it here? But it seemed like a strange thing to ask about, so he didn't. He could be supportive. He understood that, even if compassion and empathy weren't his strengths. You'd be a great mom. I hope you find what you're looking for. That was mostly true. She would be a great mom. She was fantastic with Arian, and had been ever since Arian had come to live with Braxton. He'd often seen them together. And maybe just a fleeting thought had gone through his head that Catherine was great with kids. For sure, she'd be a great mom. He wasn't exactly hoping that she'd find what she was looking for somewhere else, though. You want her to find it with you. Did he? Such a strange idea. Something he hadn't even thought about. He could move on. But now... He was unsure as to whether or not he even wanted to. Normally, he wasn't so indecisive. He also wasn't used to having his feelings in such a riot. He definitely didn't like it, and it made him agitated. He hadn't meant to squeeze her hands, but he realized he had when she squeezed back. I wasn't sure how you'd take it. I was afraid you'd be mad. But you seem to be okay. Her eyes slid over to him, and this time he squeezed her hand on purpose. I couldn't be mad. I can't be mad at you doing what's best for you. I am a little surprised and a little off kilter because I'm not sure how I'm going to handle it. The one thing I guarantee you, whatever is best for you is what I want you to do. I guess I'll have to figure out what I need to do in response. The worry hadn't gone out of her eyes. There was still just that little tilt of concern, and although he wasn't sure where the words came from, he added, We're still friends, right? And that's not going to change. She nodded, and he figured he'd said the right thing because her brow straightened. We're still friends. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to be friends with someone who's done so much for me over the years. How could I get mad and walk away? After everything you've done. After everything you've been for me. If she treated her husband half as well as she treated him. If she helped him, supported him, did everything in her power to lift him up and make him successful, the way she had with him, her husband would be one blessed man. That wasn't all Catherine was, either. Her husband would be getting a woman who was better than any woman Elias knew. She shrugged, and her hand moved a little in his. He thought she might be pulling away, and he tightened his fingers reflexively, not wanting to lose her hand, liking the way it fit in his, not realizing how well it would, after all the years they'd worked together. I guess I've seen other people fight over less. I didn't want that to happen to us. I didn't want anything to happen to us. Another sigh, and he felt bad that the whole evening had been sad and serious. Normally their relationship wasn't all jokes. 
but typically they did laugh together. I guess everything changes, though, right? That's life, one change after another. Being able to adapt to them and be okay with them is part of living. That's right. I'm sure there are pithy quotes that encapsulate that far better than I ever could. But change is a part of life, and we have to get used to it. Still, he wasn't worried about losing her business as much as he was concerned and upset about losing her. She could make a decision, and he could react to that decision in a way that maybe she wasn't expecting. She wanted a husband and family? Maybe she should consider finding that husband right in Prairie Rose. He'd have to figure out a way to give her that idea. Chapter 7 Honestly, Catherine, it sounds like he might have been interested. I can't believe you didn't at least question him. Catherine's best friend, Carmen Davis, reached up wiping the very top of the window she was washing. I didn't see that at all. I still don't. Catherine used her squeegee, putting the rubber edge against the window and pulling down. Washing windows was not her favorite job, but her friend Carmen could always use help. Her husband was a long-haul truck driver who was gone two weeks at a time at least. Carmen did most of the work around the house herself as well as taking care of her three children, as well as working full-time at the fast food restaurant in town. Maybe I'm just reading more into it than what there is just because I want that so much for you. Although, in my opinion, you might be better off with someone who's a little more thoughtful. Carmen's words were said with care, and Catherine knew that's the way she meant them. Carmen was probably the one person on the face of the earth who truly loved her, other than maybe her Aunt Lenore and Elias's Graham. Elias was a good friend, maybe her best, or tied for that with Carmen, but the relationship just wasn't the same. She and Elias knew each other really well and still liked each other, which was a feat in any relationship. But Carmen truly loved her. Elias loves you. I just don't think that people like him show it the way we expect him to, or that makes sense to us, you know? Catherine shook the water droplets off her squeegee and put it on the window again, pulling down. She believed Carmen and respected her opinion, considering her wise and patient. She'd been married for 15 years to a man who was not kind to her. He was gone all the time, which Catherine understood was because of his job. But when he was home, not only did he not take time for his wife, but he expected her to wait on him hand and foot. Plus, when he was home, he expected to treat it like a vacation from work and never did anything other than fiddle on his cars, two of which filled up their shed, and the other ten or so lay in parts and pieces which littered their front and backyards. At various times, Carmen had threatened to have someone come and haul them away, but it enraged Mike to even hear her say it. I guess I was just thinking the same thing. He cares about me. He just seems... I don't know. I don't know. She didn't even want to think about it anymore. She decided to move on. Her conversation with Elias had indicated that he was going to be okay and she mostly just wanted to move forward. He's simply selfish and self-centered, like so many people. The thing is, some people are willing to look at themselves and say, hey, I could do better, and then work on it. And some people blame their genes, or their gender, or the people around them and say, there's nothing I can do. Personally, I think Elias is in the first group, he just didn't realize how he was being, and now that he does, he'll change. And Mike is in the second group? Catherine said slowly, focusing on scrubbing the next window with the spongy part of the squeegee. She and Carmen didn't talk about Mike much. 
Catherine tried to stay away when Mike was home. Not because she didn't want to support a friend, but because her friend preferred it. Her husband was very demanding and expected her to jump when he said, Yeah. Carmen didn't say any more, and Catherine, as usual, didn't push. She admired and respected Carmen for honoring the vow she had made. Mike didn't hit her or their three children. He was just a jerk most of the time. Still, when someone was able to live with a jerk, that made them into a better person. Kinder, more considerate, more patient, and stronger. After all, it certainly took more self-control and strength to tamp down her own wants and desires and put someone else first. It was a biblical command, others first. Every once in a while, Catherine was a little jealous that Carmen was so good at being kind and considerate. But most of the time, she knew the suffering Carmen had gone through in order to become the person she was. Catherine most definitely did not envy that. Can I ask you a personal question? Catherine finally said as she scrubbed hard on a dried-on spot on the window. You sure can, Carmen said, glancing over her shoulder and down as she stood on the ladder. Isn't that what friends are for? Yes, of course. Except this is a little more personal than normal. Catherine took her fingernail and scraped at the spot on the window, although not really thinking about what she was doing, rather forming the questions she wanted to ask in her head. Is it better to not be married than to be married to someone who's a jerk and whom you struggle every day to love? Carmen's laughter rang out in the fall air. It was a little chilly, more so than a few days ago when she and Elias had sat on the park bench and talked about terminating the partnership they'd had for 15 years. The thought still made her sad, even though she was sure this was the right direction, the direction she wanted to go. The wind blew, rustling the corn leaves that were lying on the ground in the field behind Carmen's small house. All three of her children were in school, and Carmen had off from the cleaning job that she worked, in addition to being the manager of the fast food restaurant in town. So much time elapsed that Catherine wasn't even sure Carmen was going to answer. Although, Carmen was impossible to offend, and it helped Catherine more than once through trials in her life. I don't think anyone gets married thinking they're going to be married to a jerk. I mean, pretty much everyone thinks they're in love before they get married nowadays, right? I suppose, although Sean and Bridget kind of agreed to get married, I think they fell in love afterward. Catherine held her squeegee in her hand and looked up the ladder at Carmen. Plus, I know I've heard you say over and over again that falling in love is a really bad basis for a marriage. You've talked about how love is action and how we're commanded to love, commanded to show love, not feel it. Carmen smiled, a little guilty although her eyes never left the window she was washing. You're right. I guess I was trying to take the easy way out. Still, in today's world, you're not going to marry someone you think is a jerk, whether you're in love with him or not. True. So your question doesn't really make sense, right? Well, I guess I was just wondering if I should be more interested in getting married than I am in falling in love. I mean, surely there's a man out there somewhere who wants to have a family and who's lonely, wants a wife. Maybe we won't love each other, but maybe we can give each other what the other needs. I know I don't have to spell this out for you, Catherine, but there's more to marriage than just friendship. I'm 33. I think I can handle it if you want to say something a little more detailed than more than friendship. Intimacy. What a delicate word. Carmen smiled but didn't take the bait. Well, that's definitely something to take into consideration, especially if you want children. I know, but I wasn't even really thinking along those lines necessarily. If you're married to a jerk, 
there's still intimacy. So she might be 33 and too old to have a reaction, but she shivered anyway. Mike was a jerk. He was bossy and controlling, and everyone was happier when he wasn't around. She felt bad that Carmen didn't just have to put up with him. There was more. Still, Carmen had never said a word beyond what she just had, and that was only at Catherine's prodding. Whatever their relationship was, however big of a jerk Mike was, Carmen always seemed happy and content. If Catherine asked, Carmen would say that being happy and content was a choice as well, one she deliberately made every day. After all, it was a biblical command to be joyful and content. It must be possible, even if one lived with a jerk. So are you trying to tell me that the answer is an easy one? Or are you trying to tell me you don't want to answer? Catherine finally said since Carmen had given her food for thought, but hadn't answered her question. Carmen sighed as she came down the ladder, the window sparkling behind her. I guess I wouldn't have my children if I didn't have my husband. And I look at him and I try to see good. I know that God looks at him and loves him. I also know God commanded me to love him. And it must be possible if God commanded me to do it. So I wouldn't recommend marrying someone just for the sake of being married. And I definitely would not recommend marrying someone who is not more concerned about you than they are about themselves. That probably eliminates about 95% of the world's population. I'm guessing the other 5% doesn't live in Prairie Rose. <laughs> no, but then you get back to what we talked about earlier. No one's perfect, and sometimes people are willing to change when they see that what they are isn't what they want to be. That's the kind of person who would be worth marrying, whether you feel like you're in love with them or not. The idea of not marrying for love is so foreign. It's hard to wrap your mind around that, because in America, that's what we do. Yeah, if we get married at all. Exactly. But if you want to live radically, biblically, you can look at the Bible and see that it doesn't tell you anywhere in it that you need to be in love with the person you marry. You just need to love them. There's a difference, a big difference. That was one of the things she loved about Carmen. Carmen had strange ideas, but she lived them. And not only that, but after you thought about her weird ideas, they made sense from a biblical perspective. It's like Carmen read the Bible and actually understood it. Or, rather than just skimming over the words and going to the spots that she liked, she took the hard things, thought about them, then put them into practice. It was challenging to be friends with such a person. Challenging because Carmen always made her feel like she could be better than what she was. Made her want to be better. Speaking of, they'd spent all their time so far talking about Catherine and her problems. Of course, they had almost all of the windows in Carmen's house washed as well. Ready? Carmen asked as she got on one side of the ladder and Catherine on the other. Let's go, Catherine replied, picking up her end of the ladder and carrying it while she walked slowly back and set it between the last two windows on the upper story. Are you and the kids going to the corn festival? Catherine asked as she dipped her squeegee in her bucket and swished it around. Her water was dirty, but she had one window left, and she thought it would do. I'm not sure. Mike's supposed to get home late tonight or tomorrow. At least that's what he said Monday when I talked to him. It'll probably depend on what he wants to do. Carmen climbed the ladder and set to work washing the last windows, her words not bitter and not upset. Catherine couldn't imagine just taking whatever her husband did in stride, especially someone as inconsiderate as Mike. Monday had been two days ago, at the very least, he could call her every day and make sure everything was okay. 
He didn't even do that. Well, if you want to go, and if the kids are going with friends, I'll walk around with you. At least we get some good food. Elias and she were going to the state festival the next week, but Prairie Rose had their own festival, which was nowhere as big, but was still fun. I'd love that. If Mike is going to stay home and work on his cars, we'll definitely take you up on it. You'll call me? I sure will. They talked a little more about their favorite parts of the festival and what they enjoyed about it, and a little bit about Carmen's kids and what they were doing in school. Catherine couldn't believe that Carmen, who was the same age as she was, had a child who was a freshman in high school, while she was just now getting serious about needing to get married. She felt a little behind the times and worried some that maybe she'd missed her opportunity. She didn't want to dwell on that, though, so she shoved those thoughts aside and focused on enjoying her time with her friend. They were inside, enjoying a cup of tea and a sweet roll, when Carmen asked, Have you talked to your Aunt Lenore? When are you going to be able to start taking care of her? Do you have your business taken care of? I do. I guess I didn't tell you that after I talked to Elias, I went in the next day and sent off a couple of emails. The person who was interested before responded right away. They really want my website and customers. Did they give you a time frame? They did. I've already seen some money, and once the lawyers finalize the contracts, next week sometime, hopefully, I'll be done. I have to admit, I'm excited and scared, and definitely a little sad. She still hadn't gotten over the idea of walking out and leaving Elias. The idea of being in business by herself or doing anything without him, honestly, was definitely scary. Everything she had done her entire adult life had been with him beside her. I'm not sure if this is what getting divorced feels like, but I am a little afraid to walk out on my own. Elias has always been there. Maybe divorce feels a little deeper, maybe painful in a different kind of way. I don't know. I just think that at least you know you can go back to Elias at any time. And you're still friends. You're not leaving because of another person or irreconcilable differences, whatever that means. Yeah, I know. It just feels so final and so unknown. If you need anything... You know I'll help you however I can, Carmen said as she took her tea bag, squeezing the water out of it and laying it to the side of her saucer. I know. You're already so busy, working two jobs and raising three almost teenagers. They're good kids. If I hadn't gotten married, I wouldn't have them. So there is another good thing about marriage. I want kids. I get to spend a lot of time with Arian and sometimes it's hard to watch her go. I'm not even related to her. You and Elias have a lot of history together. Don't take that lightly. And he's a good man. I know. I know. Chapter 8 The next week, Catherine rode with Elias and Arian through the beautiful Iowa fall weather to the state corn festival. She had some things to see to with her equipment, and so did Elias, and they took care of business first. Neither of them were tied to a booth, though, and soon they were walking around the festival, enjoying familiar sights and pointing out new ones. Do you see anything that you want to eat? Catherine asked Arian who was happily walking between Elias and her. Aren't you going to ask me what I want? Elias asked, humor in his voice, but speaking before Arian could. Arian had had a growth spurt and was almost the same height as Catherine, so Catherine leaned forward and looked over at Elias. Let's feed our charge first, okay? Catherine said, goofing just as much as he was. Plus... Aunt Catherine doesn't even need to ask you what you want. I know she knows. Oh, really? What will I want? Arian shrugged her shoulders. 
I don't know, but somehow Aunt Catherine always remembers. Catherine's brows drew down as the thought that Arian was right tumbled through her head. She supposed anyone who had been friends as long as Elias and she would know their favorite things to eat. This has got to be the 25th year we've gone to the corn festival together. I ought to know what he wants. He's not going to know what you want, Arian said without looking at either one of them, just kind of sing-songing it out there. It made Catherine close her mouth and look straight ahead. Arian was right. Just because they'd been going to the corn festival 25 years together didn't mean that they would know what each other wanted. At least, not on Elias's side. Aren't I right? Arian said innocently because she didn't know how conflicted her words had made Catherine feel. You are. And she tried not to sound resigned. I don't believe that, Elias said. Catherine almost snorted. Not only did he not know what she wanted, but he didn't even know that he didn't know what she would want. Plus, he had never noticed that she always knew what he wanted. She took a breath, not even having to think that hard to roll the words off her tongue. You're gonna want the deep-fried corn fritters, and you'll want jalapeno sauce to go with them, not ketchup, and not mayonnaise. You want ribs from Joe's Rib Shack and you want the vinegar barbecue sauce, not honey. And after you eat all of that, you're going to complain your stomach hurts and that you ate way too much and you can barely move. But when we go buy Debbie's deep-fried donuts, you're going to want the strawberry and chocolate-filled deep-fried donut, and you're going to ask me to split it, even though I hate chocolate. Normal people don't hate chocolate, Elias muttered, but he didn't argue with her. And you, Miss Arian, Catherine said, smiling at Arian, are going to want the funnel cake with strawberry topping along with powdered sugar. And you'll try as hard as you can to eat a dozen ears of corn on the cob, and you'll insist that you can, and you'll get about three down before you can't eat any more, which will be fine with Elias because he'll finish them for you. And that's why my stomach will hurt, not because I couldn't eat everything I wanted, Elias said a little more confidently than he'd said the last. If you say so, Catherine said, raising her brows at him. She's right, Uncle Elias. Now, do you know what she wants? Catherine tried to smirk like she normally would and lift her brow in challenge, even though she actually felt more sad than confident. After all, she knew he wouldn't be able to tell anyone what she wanted. His eyes darted around the various vendors, as though thinking that if his eyes landed on something that looked familiar, he'd be able to remember whether or not she liked it. After they'd walked another twenty yards, Arian prodded him. Uncle Elias, are you done thinking? She loves the deep-fried vegetables, with ketchup, and ice cream, but not chocolate, he said, pointing to a vendor that was on the right and then the one directly across the street. And alligator fries. She loves alligator fries. You're right about that, Arian said, sounding like she'd forgotten too. Well, Aunt Catherine doesn't really like alligator fries, but she always gets them and takes them home to Graham. It's what you guys do before you leave. Yeah, I forgot about that. I always argue that they'll be cold and hard before we get home. But you two always say Graham likes them anyway, so we get them. Right. It was just her. It wasn't that he was incapable of remembering anything, since he could remember what Graham liked. It was just her he couldn't remember anything about. Tomorrow was her last day at work, and her house was already cleaned and ready for her to close up and move to her Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn's house. Hopefully, being that far away from Elias would mean that things like this wouldn't bother her anymore. Things like they'd been friends for so long, but he'd never really paid attention to her. She didn't need him to. Just, she didn't have any other friends who knew so little about her. It seemed like a huge sign of him not caring when they'd done things for so long 
and he didn't know what she wanted or what she usually did. Maybe she was just being too sensitive. Catherine? Elias's voice came between them as they continued walking down the grass track that had become trampled down with all of the foot traffic of the corn festival. Yeah, she said, inserting a smile into her voice and trying to lift her lips into a smile. They got jostled by a couple of teens that came at them from the other way, although it wasn't too busy now in the early afternoon. Not like it would be this evening after dark. What do you want to eat? He asked, and while she would have normally said that question would have been a little sarcastic and a little goofy, like he were pandering to her, his question sounded almost thoughtful. It couldn't be that he felt bad he didn't know, that she was leaving, and he was actually starting to think that maybe he had taken advantage of her. No, that was wishful thinking on her part. She loves the deep-fried corn, Arian spoke up, pointing behind them. The kind from back there, and not the one from over on the other side. They taste a lot different, and Aunt Catherine doesn't like the ones from there. And what else? Catherine opened her mouth, but Arian spoke. Deep-fried mushrooms with the blue cheese dressing, and she mixes that with ketchup. Who goes to a corn festival and eats mushrooms? Elias said. And you say that every year, Arian said. I guess I do, Elias murmured. And she likes the personal pizza that has the white sauce on it with corn, and she gets anchovies on it too, although she doesn't like anchovies. Arian lifted her brows at him, looking older than her years. You pick them off and eat them, which is why my dad says your stomach hurts. I think you might be right. I do remember picking anchovies off. I think I would have remembered that about the pizza if I'd had a little more time to think. All of this talk about food is making me hungry. Maybe we could get started, Catherine said, ready to be done with the conversation. He wouldn't have remembered about the pizza, unless maybe they were standing in front of the vendor. Even then, she doubted he would have remembered that she liked it with the Alfredo sauce and corn, along with the anchovies. She could feel herself being bitter and a little angry, and she tried to push those unwanted emotions aside. Elias was a great guy, a great businessman. He'd always been honest with her and always done way more than his share of the work. She'd been able to do more warranty work than any other online sales company for her brand. It was all because of him making sure that he was always able to squeeze it in even doing it himself if necessary. Just because he wasn't able to remember personal details about her didn't mean that he was a jerk. It just meant that he wasn't interested in her. Not like that. And she wasn't interested in him, except she'd remembered all those details. Why? Why, in all of the things that she'd experienced over the years, why were the things that Elias loved the ones that stuck in her brain? We have to ride the Ferris wheel first, Arian said, pulling her phone out of her back pocket, her thumbs flying over the screen. Oh, Elias said, looking down at her with affection. You're going to do it again. As I recall, last year you got scared and swore you were never going to ride again. That's because you were rocking the seat on purpose. Arian said, not looking up, her thumb still flying. I wasn't rocking it on purpose. I was just looking over the edge. I thought I saw someone I knew down on the bottom, right below our seat. Right, and you leaned way out over the edge and pointed straight down, pushing the seat back so that I was looking straight down at the ground. Anybody would have been scared. Arian crossed her arms over her chest but it was when the bar unlatched and flew open that I really got scared. Catherine's stomach twisted. She'd been terrified herself. She'd not only thought Arian was going to die, but the two of them as well. Elias had jerked the seat back and pulled the bar back down at the same time, latching it securely, and they'd barely slid forward, 
that Catherine's hands were sweating just remembering. You know what? I'm pretty sure Aunt Catherine calmed you down by promising that she would be the only one to ride with me this year. That's exactly right. That's why I'm texting Jenny now. She's going to meet me at the Ferris wheel, and I'm going to ride with her, and you and Aunt Catherine are going to ride together. She gave them both a look, although her eyes lingered on Catherine. Catherine remembered holding Arian, who had been sobbing in her arms. Elias had looked terrible, guilty, and contrite, and she knew he hadn't meant to make her cry. When she was younger, Arian had always loved those kinds of daredevil stunts, but last year had marked a shift, and instead of making her laugh, it had made her cry. Desperate to appease her, Catherine had said anything and everything that would come to mind, just to try to make her happy again. The idea that Catherine would ride with him and Arian would plan to have a friend was the one that had made Arian stop crying. Catherine had promised that's what she'd do this year. She had totally forgotten that promise until just now. A little voice prompted her. Elias remembered. She didn't want to give him credit for anything, though, since her feelings were still hurt that he hadn't managed to remember anything she liked. Which was stupid. His brain just didn't work the way hers did. She didn't need to get upset about it or expect him to be like her instead of like himself. Chapter 9 Elias and Catherine switched directions, walking behind the back of a hot sausage vendor and someone selling deep-fried cornflakes. Hey, there's Jenny, Arian said, raising a hand, then jogging forward to a girl that was striding toward them. I'll meet you at the Ferris wheel, she called over her shoulder. It wasn't far away, and Elias and Catherine both nodded. As long as Arian was with someone, they didn't get too concerned. Considering this festival was much bigger than their hometown corn festival, they did require that she be with a buddy in order to leave them. Not that she usually wanted to. Arian typically enjoyed spending time with them as much as they did with her. I can't believe how much she's grown up, Elias said as they kept walking toward the Ferris wheel at a much slower pace than Arian. I know. Next year, she'll be a teenager and I can hardly believe it. Time flies. It does. I guess, with you leaving... I've been thinking even more about how fast time goes by. There was a note in his voice that made Catherine look over. But he wasn't looking at her. He was watching where they were going, his eyes on Arian and her friend running toward each other and hugging, as though he were thinking more about them than Catherine. We've spent a lot of time together over the years, he finally said. We sure have. She'd spent more time with him than anyone else in her life. Her dad and brothers were away seven or eight months of the year on harvest cruise. A couple of times, they'd even gone to South Africa and harvested sugar beets and other things there. When she was younger, she'd stayed with Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn until she was old enough to stay at the house by herself, insisting to her dad that she didn't want to start at a different school and then have to switch halfway through the year. A couple of years, she'd even lived for several months with Elias's Graham. They'd gone home and done their homework together in her living room. She'd helped Elias in the chicken barn, spent a lot of time packing eggs with him when it was his turn on the farm. I guess it makes me sad to see it end. Elias's voice sounded rough, like he was trying to be tough, even though his words were talking about feelings. The fact that he was talking about feelings at all made her head jerk to him. Sad? Yeah. He shrugged, looking over at her. Is that okay? I guess. It just surprises me. You don't usually get down about anything. He didn't get down about anything, and he didn't get up about anything either. He was excessively unemotional, analytical, 
He didn't do emotions. Although he didn't say that in so many words. It was just the way he was. I think when people work together as long as you and I have, when they've been friends for as long as we have, it's only natural that your leaving would be a blow. There's nothing weird about that. No, of course not. The weird thing is that you're actually admitting it. Or that you're feeling it. Or maybe both. She wasn't sure. It didn't matter. They reached the Ferris wheel and got in line behind Arian and Jenny, who were talking a mile a minute to each other, like they hadn't just seen each other in school yesterday. You know, we never really talked about it, but you could have moved your Aunt Lenora and your Uncle Penn to Prairie Rose. I would have helped you take care of them. You wouldn't have had to give up your business. Catherine didn't say anything, mostly because she was shocked. Words flew around in her brain, ping-ponging back and forth, but she couldn't think of what she wanted to articulate. Why hadn't he said that when she'd first said that she was going to sell? It was too late, too late to do anything about it. She had handed over almost everything except the key to her office, which the fellow who was taking over wasn't going to use anyway. He lived in Oregon. They'd had several video chats and exchanged a bunch of emails. He would be taking over her website. In fact, had already begun. That would have been really nice, but it's really too late for that now. I have my house all ready to close up, and the man who's taking over my business has already made two deposits. The third is due at the end of the day, the day after tomorrow. I can't back out now. Even if she wanted to. Which... Did she? Doesn't that make you feel anything to be walking away from us? He asked. Catherine bit the inside of her cheek to hide her shock that he'd even think to ask. Of course. I'm sad. Of course I am. If he only knew. She was so much more than sad and had been for a long time. Now she just needed to get away. She was tired of putting so much into a relationship that didn't give her much in return. At least, emotionally. He was so easy to like, so easy to want to crush on. There was so much about him she admired and respected and adored. She couldn't complain about the business they had together. She couldn't complain about his friendship either. She knew all she had to do was tell him and he'd be there. But sometimes she didn't want to have to tell him. Sometimes she wanted him to be able to look at her and know she wanted something. Or give her credit for what she had done, instead of just assuming that she was going to be there. Taking advantage of her, knowing she was there and could be depended upon. Doesn't sound like it. But I guess it doesn't matter, he murmured, looking toward the front as the two girls walked up the ramp and sat down on the Ferris wheel. Neither one of them said anything as the operator closed the bar in front of them and moved the Ferris wheel, bringing several seats down. Catherine had brought a sweatshirt, which was tied around her waist, as the weather was certain to cool off once the sun went down. Right now, it was a beautiful October afternoon with a brilliant blue sky and a warm sun, flat brown fields, harvested and planted with cover crops ready for winter, stretching off in all directions. It was a beautiful day, and she was spending it with the person who had been her friend for most of her life. She should be happy. She shouldn't let the things he had just said upset her, make her wonder if she truly had made the right decision. Chapter 10 Elias stood beside Catherine as they waited in line, watching as a couple ahead of them were buckled in. You know, I haven't ridden one of these since last year. Catherine's tone was conversational, but she shifted back and forth on her feet, and he narrowed his eyes, looking at her. Neither have I. This is the only place we go that has rides. 
We should probably think about taking Arian to an amusement park again. It's been a while since we've done that. Then he remembered. Except you're leaving. It's not like I'm never going to see you again. We just won't have our businesses side by side in the same building and talk to each other every day about equipment and fixing it and all that. Her words were a little preoccupied, and as soon as she was done talking, she pulled her lips in, clamping down on her bottom teeth while her face seemed to tighten. You don't have to do this. Could she be scared? Catherine wasn't afraid of anything. She didn't typically get super excited, but she also didn't get scared either. And she loved riding rides more than he did. She and Arian had a blast three years ago when they'd taken her to the big amusement park outside of Des Moines. He'd barely been able to keep up as Arian and Catherine dragged him around the park, riding every roller coaster with their hands in the air and screaming like banshees, getting off and practically running to do it again. He didn't mind riding, exactly. But now that he was older, he got sick. And since there were three of them, he didn't mind sitting out. She seemed to be considering his words. But the smile on Arian's face and her excited wave as the Ferris wheel slowly started seemed to bolster Catherine's resolve, and her chin came up. I can do it. He smiled to himself. That was the Catherine he had known since they were in elementary school together. She didn't get scared and quit. Still, she didn't seem as confident as she walked up the short ramp to sit down. He almost reached a hand out to steady her, but that wasn't something they typically did in their friendship, and she might not appreciate it. At the very least, she'd look at him oddly. Once they sat down and the man reached over, snapping the bar closed, she didn't grab the bar, but rather her fingers dug into her legs the knuckles white. You okay? He said softly, under his breath, when the man turned and walked back to his spot, his hand on the lever, getting ready to pull it back. I am, she said, sounding anything but. Before the ride began moving them backward, he took his hand and wiggled the bar. It's fine. She nodded, her head moving up and down quickly her fingers never losing their grip on her legs. He wanted to say something more, tell her they could get out, see if she wanted to... He could... hold her hand? Something. But again, that had never been part of their relationship. Did he want that to change? He wasn't sure where that came from, but he almost didn't entertain it. Of course not. Of course he just saw Catherine as a friend, a good friend, one he could depend on for anything, one whose loyalty he didn't have to question or pander to her or wonder whether she was sincere or honest. Her loyalty wasn't in question. Her desire for his welfare was deeper than anyone else's except for his grams, probably. Along with his brothers, she was the person he trusted most in the world. He didn't want that to change. Of course, it didn't have to change. He could trust someone and like them in a romantic sense, too. Just because that had never happened before didn't mean it wouldn't. Except she was leaving. What a time for him to decide he wanted to start something when she wasn't even going to be around. Maybe it was a good time. If he did start something, and it didn't work out, they'd barely see each other, so it wouldn't be awkward. Or at least it felt that way, since her aunt and uncle lived six hours away. The ride had come to a stop to let someone else on. They were barely ten feet off the ground, well below the halfway point, and Catherine hadn't relaxed. Do you want me to ask him to let us off when we come around? Elias said, wanting to ease her mind. She shook her head, her lips pressed close together, her face completely white. Catherine, you look petrified. I'm okay, she said, although her words came out too fast and too high and with too much anxiety lacing every syllable. You sound like it, he said, 
not a little irony in his voice, but it didn't override the caring and concern he felt. The wheels started around, moving them up a few more spots until they were just above the halfway point. Aunt Catherine, Uncle Elias, hey there! Arian called, turning around and waving at them. Hey there, girl, Elias said, waving back. He glanced at Catherine, since normally she would be practically jumping up and down in her seat and waving her arm off. But she just sat there, barely lifting her fingers from her leg. Her, hey, Arian, sounded anemic. Don't forget what happened to us last year, Arian, Elias said, a warning in his tone, although his words were still light. Trust me, I'm not likely to forget that, Arian said, rolling her eyes. She turned back around as the Ferris wheel began to move again. This time, it moved a little bit further, until he and Catherine were sitting at the very top. Normally, they would talk about what a gorgeous view it was, and how pretty their state was, how much they loved this time of year, how different these fields would look in the spring or in the winter, covered in snow and snuggled down in that cold blanket. But Catherine seemed to be frozen and her shoulders went up and down quickly, as though she were gasping for each breath and breathing about five times as fast as normal. To heck with their relationship or ruining it. It was obvious she was scared, and all he could think to do was to lift his arm and put it around her shoulder, moving ever so gently a little closer, slowly, so as not to rock their car at all. Even so, there was a little tilt and her breath hitched before she gasped and it started again in audible puffs. I wish I could do something for you. She didn't say anything, just concentrated on breathing. He didn't think it was his imagination that she seemed to lean into him. Catherine, stop breathing like that. One slow breath in, one slow breath out. You can do it, honey. Endearments weren't a part of their relationship either, but he felt so protective of her. She was obviously petrified, and he could hardly stand it. As soon as we go around, I'm going to ask him to let you off. She didn't even argue with him, which convinced him that was the right thing to do. Catherine hadn't listened to him about the breaths, and she was still puffing like a marathon runner at the finish line. He figured the only thing he could do to get her to stop would be to get her off, get her somewhere where she could sit down and calm down. He didn't blame her. It had been scary last year when the bar over their seat hadn't gotten latched tight, and he'd been goofing and they'd almost fallen out. But Catherine wasn't the kind of person to let something like that upset her. She'd ridden the rest of the ride without seeming to have any ill effects, and once they got Arian calmed down, they'd laughed about it. A person's brain could react in weird ways when they were least expecting it, he supposed. Like him feeling the warmth of Catherine's shoulder, the slenderness of her arm, and thinking how that contrasted with his own. He was sitting close enough to smell her apples and caramel scent, and while it wasn't a new scent, he couldn't remember having it steep into his cells just the way it was now. Suddenly, the ride jerked, started forward. Something sounded like a crack. Then everything went still. The jerk had made their seat swing, which made Catherine's breath gasp. She did not resist when Elias pulled her to him. Somehow her hand had gone from gripping her leg to gripping his. She was strong, but it didn't hurt. Almost felt good, like he was giving her something to hold on to, to keep her from losing it completely. Tempted to lean over the edge of the car to see if the dude had ripped the start lever off or something, he didn't. I feel like I'm going to pass out, Catherine said, her voice breathy, scared, and soft. You're going to pass out and leave me up here by myself? I'll still be here, you doofus she said, and while her voice sounded just as breathless and just as scared, there was a bit of humor in it. I find it hard to believe that someone who can say the word doofus is on the verge of passing out. I guess you're going to have to prove it to me. 
Catherine had always liked a challenge. They'd faced a lot of them together in their businesses, looking at things, asking each other if they really thought they could do it. And then they'd get those grins on their faces as they looked at each other, saying, oh yes, they could. Hold tight, folks, a man's voice called out from beneath them, quieting the chatter that had gradually erupted as the Ferris wheel continued to sit without moving. We've got a mechanic on his way, but it's going to be at least half an hour. Just sit still and enjoy the view. Catherine's breathing had gasped and then sped up after the man's words. Elias could feel himself getting nervous. What was he going to do if Catherine freaked out? She wasn't going to get to that point. He wouldn't let her. Clanging came from below, and Elias assumed that the folks near the bottom were getting off. They were a little toward the front, and he hoped that Arian and Jenny would be some of the ones who would be able to leave. It wasn't that it was dangerous to be stuck. It was just he hated her to be sitting, bored out of her mind, for however long it took to fix. He didn't believe that half-hour estimation. Not for one second. You really think it's going to take half an hour? Catherine asked as she looked gingerly around. No, Elias said, hoping she didn't question which way he thought the estimation was going to go. Do you think Arian was able to get off? She asked, still panting. Her fingers had not loosened their grip on his leg. I'm sure she'll yell at us if she can. I could lean over and- No, Catherine interrupted him. Then her voice marginally softened, although she was still breathless. Please, don't move. Sorry, I know this has never happened to me before, but I just feel petrified, like my whole body is going to explode. And there's this sense of doom like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. Chapter 11 Catherine ended the last phrase on a bit of a gasp, and Elias felt a cold chill shoot through his entire body. Could he get her down if she was truly having a heart attack? Tempted to call for an ambulance, he hesitated for just a moment. Catherine's brothers and father were healthy as horses. Heart disease didn't run in her family. She'd obviously been scared getting on, and he suspected that it might be a panic attack. You remember that lady I told you about at the business dinner I went to in Des Moines earlier this year? Catherine kind of wobbled her head and lifted her shoulders, and he assumed that was a no. We were walking into the restaurant. She had a panic attack as she was walking by me as I held the door open. We all thought she was having a heart attack, but she was able to gasp out that she had had panic attacks before and she thought that's what it was. We sat down, got her a little bit to drink, but the thing that really helped her was the hostess came down, hunkered in front of her, and coached her to control her breathing. Coached her how? Catherine said, interested, despite the terror still in her voice and her breathlessness. Like I was saying to you earlier, control your breathing. She said something like, Control your breathing and you control your fear, or something like that. He shook his head. He wished he would have paid more attention, but at the time, he'd been hungry. He'd known he wasn't the best person to deal with anyone who was having any kind of medical emergency, so he'd stood back and let other people who were good at it do what they were good at. Nothing had needed to be fixed. That's what he was good at. The irony of their situation almost made him laugh. If Catherine were fine, he might have actually climbed out of his seat and down the Ferris wheel and offered to fix it himself. But there was no way he was going to rock the car or do anything that would cause Catherine more distress. Not to mention, he wasn't leaving her. What kind of control? She asked, her words clipped. I remember it took her a little bit to get calmed down, so... Just take a deep breath and try not to panic. He ran his hand down her arm. That was the other thing with the lady in the restaurant. Someone had been holding her hand and stroking it all the time. He took his other hand, reached across his body, and placed it over Catherine's that was gripping his leg. 
He tried to speak in a soothing tone. See if you can relax your fingers as you relax your breathing. Once you're not panting anymore, we'll start to count as you breathe in. And then, if you're able, hold it for a little bit before blowing out slowly. I remember overhearing that lady say that was the one thing that really calmed her down, blowing out as long as she could. He wasn't sure where that memory came from, but he was grateful for it. As he spoke, Catherine had been able to slow down her breathing. She was no longer panting. I feel weird, like I need more air. It's okay. I'm pretty sure you don't. As much as you're panting, what you probably need is less air. If he had a paper bag, he might recommend she put it over her face. As it was, they would have to make do with what they had, hoping she had the self-control to force herself to breathe more slowly, against her feelings. And she did. Her chest was no longer puffing up and down, although her hand still tensed on his leg. Some of the fear had left her face. It might help if you closed your eyes, he said soft and low, trying to infuse a gentle, reassuring tone into his voice, one that would help her feel relaxed and not give her any idea of the anxiety that tugged through his own chest not because of being stuck at the top of the Ferris wheel, but because if Catherine couldn't get calmed down, he didn't even want to think about what might happen. She wouldn't try to climb out of the Ferris wheel car, would she? And it wasn't like any EMTs could get to her. Not where they were now. Not without scaring her a lot more by rocking the car. She had obeyed, and her eyes went shut. He pulled on her arm just a little, and her head leaned back into his shoulder. That's good, he said in the same low voice. You really slowed your breathing down. You ready to take in a deep breath? Her head barely moved on his arm. If I really concentrate, I can feel myself getting a hold. Of what? I don't know. But I can just tell that I'm strong enough to push the fear aside. But I have to focus. Her words kind of trailed off, as though she'd lost her focus and she was getting it back. Perfect. Start breathing in, and I'll count for you. Try to do it for at least five seconds. If he recalled correctly, the hostess had had the lady she was helping do it for eight. But he wasn't sure that Catherine could do eight right now. She started breathing in, and he counted. Once he reached five, he said, Now, hold it while I count to five. He counted, one second at a time, although by the time he got to the last number, her face had started to scrunch up like it was starting to distress her. Good girl. Now blow it out. Slowly. He counted again. This time, he made it to ten before she was finished blowing out and there was almost a smile on her face when she was done. I can't believe I can actually feel the stress leaving with the air blowing out of my lungs. Her eyes opened wide, searching for his. It's like a miracle. He grinned. I'll have to take your word for it. I've never actually experienced it. I just saw that hostess doing it. I'm so glad you remembered. You mind helping me through it again? I sure will. Can you make it to eight? On the in and out, I'm sure of it. On the holding, I don't know. We'll try. There's nothing set in stone that says you have to. After all, five seconds worked. She nodded, her brows knitting like she was focusing as she started drawing air in. That time she blew air out. Her fingers loosened on his leg. He kept his hand over hers, not wanting to lose her hand, although glad that the tension was leaving her. It's not that he didn't want her to get better. He just, just liked their closeness and didn't want to lose it. He couldn't remember ever touching her like this before. As much as they'd done together, he'd never actually held her. 
Maybe it was a little bit odd that he wanted to, but since she'd decided to leave, he'd been thinking things he'd never thought before, and now he was feeling them, too. I don't think I want to open my eyes just yet, but I feel so much better, Catherine whispered. You look better, too, and you no longer have your hand digging into my leg. I think I might not lose it after all. She cracked one eye, spearing him with a narrowed look. Really? It was that much of a hardship? He probably shouldn't admit this, but... No, it wasn't a hardship. In fact, this might not be the best time to admit that I've been sitting here dreading the idea that you might take your hand away. Her breath huffed out a little, a soft laugh. He didn't have the heart to tell her he hadn't been joking. Is it such an unbelievable idea? He asked, not really meaning to. We're all business, you and me. On your side, anyway. Although you shared your family with me. Maybe she had more to say. It hadn't really sounded like she was done, but she didn't say anything else. We're friends. Yeah, she said, although it didn't sound like a sure yeah just that she was agreeing so he wouldn't argue. Why would we not be friends? He asked, just as though she had disagreed with him, since that seemed to be what her answer had implied, even though the word was correct. I don't know. She lifted her shoulder. We see each other every day. We know a lot about each other. You'd do anything for me, and I think you know I'd do anything for you, since... After all, I'm sitting at the top of the Ferris wheel counting to eight over and over again. If that doesn't prove that I'll do anything, I don't know what does. <laughs> That's easy, she said with a little grin, her eyes closed again. If we were in a shark cage under the water and one of the bars fell off and you placed yourself between me and the shark, she lifted her shoulder. You'd get friendship credit for that. I should get, like, sacrificial love credit for that. They laughed. See, we laugh together. That's what friends do. You take advantage of me a lot. I don't have any other friendships where that happens or where it's quite so one-sided. She said with her eyes still closed and the smile was gone. She was serious. She couldn't see his mouth hanging open and his eyes searching her face not really seeing it, but his brain was wheeling, trying to figure out if that was actually a true statement. I take advantage of you? He wanted to deny it, but Catherine didn't typically go around hurling accusations at people that weren't entirely true. In fact, he wasn't sure she'd ever hurled any kind of accusation at him. The fact that she had meant he should probably take it seriously. Sure. You always just assume that I'm going to be there. That I'm going to do whatever it is I'm supposed to do. You don't really thank me. You definitely don't notice that I'm even there. And you never say anything nice. And I know it's not because you can't since you compliment other people all the time. His mouth was still open as he processed her words. Like today. I don't mind at all bringing Arian. She feels like my own. But that's just the thing you assumed. You assumed I would go with you, assumed it would be fine if Arian went, assumed you could drive, and you decided what time to leave. You made all the decisions, and you didn't really ask. I didn't realize you wanted me to, he murmured. It was true. He hadn't even thought about it. She just went along with whatever he did, and it didn't occur to him to check with her every time he had something to do. But I guess that's not really a big deal, necessarily. It's just, I know what you eat. I know where you go, like we were talking about earlier. And you have no idea what foods I like, or what I might want to see, or anything about me. It's like you've never really paid attention to me, even though we've been around each other for years. 
She blew a breath out, slow, like she was getting tensed up again and she was calming herself down. He didn't say anything while she did that, still wondering if she was right. Thinking about the other friendships he had. He supposed he knew what his brothers liked, but mostly because they liked what he did. Catherine was different. Although she was absolutely correct, he had no clue what food she liked, no idea what she wanted to eat if it wasn't what he did. And that's different than any of the other friendships I have. I know what my friends like. I pay attention. I know what their favorite colors are, what their favorite foods are, what kind of movies they like, what kind of car they would buy if they could afford to buy anything. Just stuff that people know about each other when they're friends and they like each other. Stuff that I know about my friends that I know about you. She opened her eyes and looked at him. You have no clue about me. It feels, it feels like I'm putting a lot more into this relationship than you are. And that's not really a friendship. It's not really a balanced relationship. So this is a toxic relationship for you? He asked, feeling a little blindsided, like he'd been doing something wrong and she'd never said anything. No. Her voice didn't raise, but it was emphatic. Absolutely not. That's not what I was trying to say. Just, I guess maybe, I like you more than you like me. And that meant I put more of myself into our relationship. It's not toxic, but it's probably time that I face the fact that we're not really great friends, even though we've spent a lot of time together. Chapter 12 Elias's brain felt scattered. He felt blindsided because he had no idea that she'd even thought any of this stuff before. He just figured they knew each other. They worked well side by side without having to talk a lot. He didn't need to ask her what time they were going to leave. Or if he told her what time he wanted to leave and it didn't suit her, he figured she'd speak up. He expected her to speak up. If you didn't like the time that I was leaving, you know you could have said so, and I would have changed it. No questions asked. I know. Then I don't understand what the problem is. You just assume everything. It's like I don't even need to be here. You just assume everything's going to happen the way you want, and you don't need to consult with me at all. He wasn't sure he understood since technically he didn't need to consult with her. And she admitted that if she didn't like it, she knew she could speak up and he would change it. It wasn't making any sense to him. But again, Catherine wasn't the kind of person who threw a fit about nothing. There must be something, just he wasn't seeing it. I guess, I guess I thought that showed that we really knew each other that we were comfortable with each other if I didn't have to talk to you for 15 minutes about what time we were going to leave. With someone I don't know as well, where I feel like I need to be really careful or I'll hurt their feelings, I might have a whole conversation with them about what time we should leave. But with you, I feel comfortable. I know. That's what I'm saying. You take advantage of me. He wanted to blow a breath out in frustration but he didn't want her to think that he was angry or upset. Somehow, he figured that wasn't going to help his side of the conversation. So, I think we feel comfortable, which shows a close friendship, and you think I'm taking advantage of you, which shows that we're not really friends at all? Both of her eyes were open now. Although her head stayed on his arm, it turned a little, and she looked him in the eye. You're saying that and making it sound like I'm not making any sense. I guess that's the way I'm hearing it. Her lips pressed together, like she might have been a little frustrated or upset that he wasn't understanding her. But then they seemed to deliberately relax. Maybe that's the difference between male and female. Maybe. That made sense. 
Although, I guess you're kind of right about me taking advantage of you. I guess I just assume you're going to be around, and I didn't know that bothered you. I didn't know you wanted me to talk to you about stuff. One lip pulled back, and she tugged at her hand, but he squeezed, and she stopped, relaxing it back on his leg. Clanging came from down below, and the murmuring of men's voices. Noises and smells from the fair sifted lightly on the late afternoon air. Popcorn, carnival music, the shouts of game attendants trying to draw passers-by to their stalls. And over that, the overarching smell of fall settling down on the sleeping cornfields of Iowa swept through it all, making him want to inhale and hold his breath, keeping the good smell inside him, the smell of hard work, heat, and success, all together as it settled down for the winter. Time to rest. That's not exactly what I mean, she finally muttered. Will you agree with me that whatever it is that you do mean, you know that I didn't mean to slight you or hurt you or neglect you? I know. I'm not angry at you. I just... I guess when you think about someone, you're considerate. And you haven't been very considerate. Ah, that made sense. He was starting to understand now. She viewed his lack of consulting her, his assumptions that she would be there, what he assumed showed friendship, as a lack of consideration. You just give a lot of attention to other people, and a lot of times I feel like I get regulated to the back seat. I don't mind once in a while, but it seems like it's that way all the time and that whenever you need a companion to go somewhere, there I am. I'm sorry. I see what you're saying now. He almost wanted to laugh, because she was right. As he'd explained earlier, with people that he didn't know, he spent a lot more time being kind and considerate of their feelings, since he wasn't sure whether or not he would offend them. But with Catherine... He assumed that she wouldn't be offended and that he didn't have to cater to her every desire. But she saw his lack of consideration for her as pushing her aside and taking advantage of her, and maybe even that he didn't like her as much as he liked the other people who he was being more considerate to. That was a reasonable assumption. One that almost made him smile because... That meant that Catherine cared about him. Did it make you think that I liked other people more than I like you? He finally asked, although it seemed like a dumb question to him. But if it were true, then maybe his thoughts were on the right track. And maybe Catherine's feelings for him were very similar to what he had realized that his feelings for her might be. Deepening from friendship to something more. He hardly dared hope. But like a bucket of cold water, his next thought squashed those hopes. She was leaving. She had sold her business. She wasn't deepening her feelings from friendship to anything. She was getting away from her hurtful relationship. Of course it did, she said, sounding a little irritated. Like that should have been something that he knew. And of course, it was something he'd been able to figure out, which probably meant he should have known it. Why wouldn't she think he liked someone better than her if he treated them better? He hadn't had the luxury of seeing a good relationship with his parents growing up, but he supposed that the hallmark of a good relationship would be that each person in the relationship treated the other person better than they treated casual acquaintances, or worse, strangers. And as he'd just displayed, for years apparently, it was very easy to take advantage of the people who were closest to you and not treat them as well as you would treat strangers that you barely knew. I think I've been dumb, he finally said. Her eyes snapped open and her lips curved. You think? she said, just a little sarcasm in her words. I do. He didn't respond to her sarcasm, but rather leveled his eyes at her, his expression serious. 
he had never meant to make her feel marginalized or unappreciated, that she wasn't important to him, or that he didn't care what she wanted or what she thought. That hadn't been his intention at all, ever. Is that why you quit? I didn't quit. Her tone sounded defiant, defensive. He shook his head. I didn't mean it like that. I meant, that's why you were leaving? Why you sold your business? Why you agreed to take care of your Aunt Lenore? In his mind, everything seemed to click. She hadn't been nearly as happy with their situation as he had. He'd gotten everything he wanted, felt comfortable and happy, and hadn't realized she hadn't been getting what she needed. Because looking back, he could clearly see that she had done all of those things she accused him of not doing. She always checked with him, always asked his opinion, deferred to him quite often, and certainly never argued with him in front of anyone. They might have discussions, but he would never term them arguments. Tonight was proof enough of that. She knew his likes and dislikes, what he wanted and what he didn't want. He hadn't done nearly as well for her, and he could see how she thought their relationship wasn't equal. It was lopsided. Her eyes were open, staring up into the sky, and he looked up, following her gaze. The first stars of the evening were starting to come out, and he realized the air had chilled down. The sunset had the sky glowing off in the distance, and mercury shone bright not far above the horizon. That's part of the reason, she finally said, answering his question about whether his behavior had caused her to want to leave. Only part? His brows drew together as he searched the sky, looking for the bright stars that seemed to appear before his eyes. Was there more? Was there more he hadn't even realized he was doing? He'd been telling her the honest-to-God truth when he said he hadn't meant to do any of the things that she'd pointed out he'd been doing. Yeah, she said softly, but didn't elaborate. So he prompted. What's the other part? He held his breath. Maybe he didn't want to know. The sounds of the fair went on around them. He could hear the workmen down below talking to each other every once in a while, and now and again came a clang or clank of a metal wrench or socket. He wasn't sure she was going to answer, but then she finally said, I know you think this is so cliché, but I want a family, a husband. I want children. I want, I just want all of that. I want to be a mom, a wife. Plenty of women own businesses, work, and get married and have children. His words were automatic, but his mind was whirling. She sat there, her head on his arm, her body next to his, her hand in his, her scent all around, and, well, maybe yesterday he wouldn't have said that he had any romantic interest in her, but he still wasn't sure he would have been okay with her wanting someone other than him. He just hadn't given it much thought. He didn't like thinking about it now. He almost blurted out that he could marry her. He could be a husband. He wanted a family too. But surely if she wanted him, she would have said something. She wouldn't be leaving him. She'd be trying to get closer to him. Obviously, she hadn't considered him when she was thinking about a husband and family. I know, but there's just not anyone in Prairie Rose, and I need to broaden my prospects. If I move in with Aunt Lenore, I'll be in a whole different town. Maybe there will be someone there who would be interested in me. A man would have to be crazy not to be interested in you, he said before he could shut his lips over the words. I guess there are a lot of crazy men around then. She gave a humorless laugh and turned her head to look at him. Maybe she caught a little of the expression on his face, a little more emotion than what he wanted her to see. 
because he thought her expression said that he was one of the crazy ones. He looked back up at the sky. I see the handle of the Big Dipper, he said. Stupid. Things get too charged emotionally and he starts talking about the stars. He was so dumb. I see it too, she said, her head turning back. If we were in my backyard right now, we could probably see the whole thing. You're probably right. All the lights of the fair cancel out the stars. Maybe it was a stretch for him to think that all of the things in his life had clouded his vision of who had been in his office all this time. So you're leaving because you want to find a man to marry you? He said, wanting to make sure he didn't misunderstand. Mostly. And the other part is because I take advantage of you? It's not as bad as all of that. You just said we were friends, and I'm not sure it's a great friendship. I'm sorry about that, he said, sincere in his apology and hoping that she would accept it. It's okay. I don't mean to rake you over the coals or anything. I'm sure there were times when I failed you as well. Maybe I failed you more. You just didn't notice. Isn't that the problem? I didn't notice you. She nodded against his arm, confirming his words without saying anything. You know, I wouldn't mind having a wife and children too. Chapter 13 Where did that line come from? What was he even trying to say with that? Well, I guess when I get to Aunt Lenore's, I'll let you know if I see anyone who might be interesting. Was there hurt in her tone? Had he said something wrong again? He wouldn't know unless he asked. What was wrong with what I just said? She blew through her nose. <sighs> Nothing. Nothing means something. I remember my brother Braxton saying that about women. She laughed outright at that, and he had to join her. Braxton wasn't exactly an expert on women, considering that he'd gotten married years ago, but had spent most of his life living apart from his wife. They were back together now, but still, anything Braxton said about women could probably be ignored. Sorry. If I'm talking about relationships and want to win our discussion, I'd better not quote Braxton. I agree with that. Her head turned and they grinned at each other. He loved that she knew him so well. No one in his family knew his mind so well that they knew what he was going to say before he said it. He loved that. How could he not know her as well as she knew him? because he'd gone around not paying attention to her, taking advantage of the fact that she paid attention to him and he paid attention to whatever was right in front of him and not who was beside him. You're not ending our friendship, right? He finally said, not sure how to broach the idea of them being more than friends, especially since she'd been complaining that he was a terrible friend. She probably wouldn't want to be more. No. So what qualities are you looking for in this husband that you think you might run into when you move in with Aunt Lenore? Are you teasing me? She tilted her head toward him, a quizzical look on her face, like she was seriously trying to figure out his words. No, I'm being serious. If you can look out for a girl from me... I can do the same for you. She seemed satisfied with that answer, and her face became thoughtful, if a little closed. Well, I want someone dependable. A Christian, for sure. I don't want to go into a marriage with someone who doesn't have my beliefs. Same. That made her head turn. Same as in that's what you're looking for in the girl you want to marry? That's right. I'll keep that in mind. What does he have to look like? I don't care about that. Really? 
You don't care if he's handsome or not. I thought that's what women wanted. Tall, handsome, with big muscles. That seemed to be what they all said. She lifted her shoulders. I suppose I would prefer that he is taller than me, but I'm not that tall, so that wouldn't be a hardship. Beyond that, and I don't even really care about that, if he's the right guy, it won't matter how tall he is. But muscles are important. <laughs> no. She laughed on a short breath. I mean, I want him to know how to work, but I would prefer character over muscles. I want him to protect me, to defend me, but that doesn't always take muscles. She kept her gaze on him as she said, Am I looking for a beautiful woman? No, I guess I'm with you. I've been with so many women who don't have character, I would prefer that over looks any day. What character traits are important to you? Her voice seemed to be studiously uninterested. Especially loud clanging reminded him that people were still working on the Ferris wheel. He stole a glance at Catherine's face. All the tension had eased out of it, and she seemed completely relaxed. Her hand had moved from under his, and he was tempted to slide his fingers between hers but he didn't want to jolt her out from wherever her mind had gone that had made her stop thinking about being afraid. He didn't want to trigger another panic attack. He didn't know anything about them other than what happened in the restaurant that night, and he didn't know if a person was more likely to have one if they'd just had one or even what the triggers were. Is that a hard question? She asked, her tone the same. She sounded disappointed with that last. Character's far more important. I said I don't really care what they look like, but I don't want someone that's grumpy all the time. Goodness, you couldn't stand that, Catherine said with feeling in her voice. He complained more than once after talking to someone or getting off the phone with them that they could make a little bit of an effort to be nice. I know. I wouldn't want to wake up with someone who couldn't find anything nice to say about the day. I don't even really want to wake up with someone who can't find anything nice to say before coffee. She chuckled a little. Better to wake up alone. For sure. Someone who ruins your day before you even get out of bed is hardly someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. I wonder how you'd find that out. She sounded puzzled, and he didn't say anything. Most people didn't have too much trouble figuring that out before they got married. But Catherine wasn't that kind of girl. Her head went over, and he saw she was grinning. He returned it, shaking his head. So is happiness a character trait? He said, changing the subject they hadn't even really spoken about. That was another thing he loved about being friends with Catherine. They knew each other so well they could have whole conversations without saying a word. Conversations underneath other conversations, where they understood what was going on and no one else did. Joy. It was a simple word, but she was right. That's also a fruit of the spirit. It's a good one to cultivate. Is that it? Maybe at one point in a different situation or in a different conversation, Elias would have answered the question flippantly said that the most important character trait was someone who didn't use the last of the toilet paper without replacing the roll, or someone who shared potato chips and didn't just eat them all for herself. But if he really thought about it, he realized that a lot of the character traits he thought were important were character traits that Catherine had. Not a lot. All. And maybe he'd lost his opportunity because he was dumb or slow, or had just thought that he needed to be better than his maleness, or whatever. But he leaned his head back and answered seriously. I'd want her to be a lot like you, to have the same character traits that you have. Loyalty, honesty, compassion and empathy, forgiveness, trustworthiness, and, of course, a steady temperament where she doesn't fly off the handle about things or have really high days and really low days. He kept his gaze fixed on the stars, although he wasn't seeing them. 
He'd never complimented her like that. Not even close. And why not? Didn't kind words make people feel good? If he thought them, why wouldn't he use them on someone he thought of as much as he did Catherine? She was right. She was always telling him thank you and complimenting him for his ability to squeeze her repairs in and get them done, and she hardly ever missed an opportunity to tell him that he did something well. She'd even complimented his honesty and his integrity. At the time, he'd just kind of brushed her words off, although they made him feel really good. But he'd never done the same back to her. She was very still beside him, almost like she quit breathing, and he moved his eyes, checking to see that her chest was still rising and falling without moving his head. He'd probably shocked her. This would be a really good time for the Ferris wheel to be fixed and to start up again. It would get him out of an awkward situation. Even as he thought that, he didn't really want it to happen. He'd been blind and obtuse long enough. He could explain it away by saying that he wasn't the kind of person who noticed other people, but that didn't really make him sound any better. But he'd been serious when he said that one of the things he wanted in his future wife, one of the things that Catherine had, was the ability to forgive. She didn't usually hold his stupidity against him. When she didn't say anything, he ventured something else that he might not normally have said, but they were deep enough into the conversation that he felt like he might as well go all in. It's kind of funny the way the character traits you want in your husband are similar to what I have, and the character traits that I'd like in a wife are similar to what you do, isn't it? Chapter 14 Elias tacked on that last question as an afterthought, not wanting Catherine to be able to sit there and not answer or not say anything. Still, it was several long moments before she took a breath. Isn't it? That wasn't really an answer, and it certainly wasn't what he was wanting to hear. I kind of feel like two people who work together as well as we do. Maybe we shouldn't mess with a good thing. Maybe he shouldn't go there. Maybe he should just let it go. Probably. But he just couldn't believe that they were so compatible, that they had so much they admired in each other, and she was going to walk away from it all and leave him. He felt betrayed. Not that she couldn't go do whatever she wanted to go do. Just he hadn't expected to be left behind. Hadn't anticipated that she might not be happy with what they were doing. Hadn't been given the opportunity to try to change her mind. Or to change himself if that was what it took. You know, if you would have told me that you were thinking about leaving, if you would have said that I take advantage of you and ask me to fix it, if you would have pointed all those things out to me, I would have changed. I would have made sure that you didn't feel like you were being taken advantage of, made sure that I was more considerate, and that I noticed and paid attention to you. Surely you know that. For the first time since they'd gotten stopped, she straightened, moving completely away from him. I'm feeling so much better. Sorry I had such a terrible reaction. You must be frustrated and think I'm such a scaredy cat. Not at all. I'm not frustrated in the slightest, and I don't think you're a scaredy cat. I've worked with you, remember? One little panic attack isn't going to change my opinion of you. In fact, a million panic attacks won't change my opinion of you. Plus, if I know you, you're going to figure out whatever you need to do in order to conquer this thing, and they won't be happening again. He grinned a little as he straightened and didn't hold on as she removed her hand from his leg and from underneath his. But he wasn't going to let her off the hook that easily. You didn't really answer my question, but completely changed the subject. Pretty obviously. She sighed. It's a woman thing. That's a cop-out. 
Same as me saying because I'm a man I can't be considerate. You know I can, it's just not something that comes naturally. But if I'm interested, if I want to, I can do it. So can you. Her smile was a little self-effacing, like she agreed with everything he was saying. I know. It's a cop-out. Pulling the woman card, same as pulling the man card. Sure, we're not the greatest at some things, but we can get better if we want to. I agree completely. So tell me, why didn't you say anything? Because I felt stupid. She crossed her arms over her chest as if protecting herself before she looked over at him. Doesn't that sound dumb? Oh, you didn't give me enough attention. You didn't treat me right. You didn't compliment me in the right way, and you hurt my feelings. It's just dumb. You can't put those kinds of things into words without feeling stupid. I see. He supposed he could kind of see what she was saying. You could have said, I'm not happy. You could have said, you're taking advantage of me. And you could have said, I'm only taking advantage of you because you let me. Stop letting me and then I won't. Okay, that's a good point. I know, but I didn't want you to stop taking advantage of me because I told you to. I wanted you to stop because... He held his breath, but she had gone silent. Finally, he prompted her. Because why? She sighed a sigh that seemed to come the whole way from her toes and blew it out on the fragrant night air. <sighs> because of what we were just saying. It's not something that comes naturally to you, but if you care enough, you can change it. I just figured you didn't care enough. And Catherine! Uncle Elias! Are you guys still stuck? Arian called up to them. Elias's eyes scanned the ground until he saw her standing beside her friend, an ice cream cone in her hand. As soon as she yelled, she took another lick. Looks like we might be up here all night, he said, glad that Catherine had been able to get a hold of herself and seemed almost as good as new, like her old self. Except nothing would be the same. And there he was being dramatic, when he would have sworn that he was the least dramatic person on the planet. Oh, goodness, I hope not, Catherine said with such fervor that he turned to look at her, wondering if she truly was completely better. But she was smiling, although that might have been solely for Arian and her friend's benefit. We're almost done down here, a man's voice called. There was a collective chatter of relief from everyone who'd been stuck in the cars at the announcement. It's only been an hour. Feels like a lot longer than that, Elias said after looking at his watch. I appreciate you staying here with me, rather than going down and trying to fix it yourself. Might not have taken quite as long, but I didn't want to be alone. And I didn't want you to be alone. Not to mention, I didn't want to shake the car getting out of it. So you did think about it, Catherine asked slanting him a gaze before directing her attention back at Arian, who was calling out that she was going to the horse barns and that she'd text them before she went anywhere else. We'll text you when we get down and meet up somewhere. Elias waved as she walked off with Jenny. Arian waved as well, licking her ice cream cone as she and her friend hurried off. I did, Elias said, referring to her previous question. The intimate atmosphere that had rested between them for so long seemed to have dissipated, and he figured he probably couldn't get it back. Not that he really wanted to. He'd already said more than he should have anyway. Still, he felt like her accusation was a little unfair. The idea that if he cared, he would have changed. He did care. How could he have known he needed to change? If she hadn't told him there was a problem, how could he have known? How could he have known what to do to fix it if he hadn't even realized there was a problem? It's not too late now. The voice came out of nowhere, 
in his head. Could he fix it? Is there any way that the sale wouldn't go through? He asked. Catherine's head didn't exactly snap toward him, but she did look at him quickly, with her brows drawing down. No, it's done. The papers are signed, and almost everything is handed over. I'm just there to help them out if they need anything and make sure things go smoothly. He nodded. Think, man, there's got to be another way. So, you said we're still friends. You must not be holding it against me that I wasn't considerate and took advantage of you? I never should have said anything. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it as a huge insult. I was just trying to explain why I was leaving. Because you're looking for a husband and children. That's right. She seemed resigned to the fact that he was never going to understand. That's what her tone said anyway. He took a breath. What did he have to lose? What about me? You'll go on and you'll be just fine. Doing your business? No. I meant, what about me as a husband? Chapter 15 Catherine knew her mouth hung open. She couldn't help it. If Elias would have said that before everything went down weeks ago, she would have taken him up on it without even thinking twice. Maybe. Okay, probably not after she thought about it. Sure, she really, really liked him, but... The whole reason she was leaving was because he had basically not ever seen her, known her, the real her. How much worse would it be if they were actually married? Still, she managed to close her mouth and look at him. He was a great man. He had all the character qualities she was looking for in a man. He'd make a great dad, too. He was wonderful with Arian. But did she really want to be in a marriage where her husband neglected her? If he said he was going to change, he will. He was being honest when he said he didn't realize what he was doing. The voice in her head was right. But she still wasn't sure what to say. It wasn't like she wanted to get married tomorrow. She wanted to see that he would change first. Or maybe just see how it would be if he did. Not to mention, there had to be things that she was doing wrong. Before she could say anything, the same voice that had said the Ferris wheel was almost fixed called up. All right, everyone, hang on, we're going to start up again. A little shot of fear went through her, juicing her veins, making her feel like they were on fire. It would be okay. Everything would be okay. She breathed in slowly, holding her breath like Elias had just taught her, then blowing it out. Another attack? He said, sounding concerned, not irritated that she hadn't answered his previous question. No, just a little anxiety. Her words were interrupted as the Ferris wheel started again. She couldn't grip the front bar. Too many bad memories of what had happened last year. Hold on to me he said as if he could read her mind. Of course he knew. That's what had started this to begin with. She gripped his leg like she had before while he pulled her tight against him as the Ferris wheel jerked to another stop, this time with the motor still running. Their car swayed back and forth, and her stomach lurched. She swallowed hard and took another deep breath. We're almost there, Elias said his voice calming and soothing her. I'm sorry. This has been a terrible ride for you. Normally, we would have had a lot of fun being stuck at the top. Don't worry about it. After what happened last year, I completely understand how this could be a little scary. Hard enough to get on the ride, let alone be stuck. She laughed a little self-consciously and looked up at him. His eyes held affection. They always did, and her laugh faded away. He did like her. Really. 
She believed that. It was never a matter of her wondering whether or not he liked her. Not really. She just figured he didn't like her quite as much as he liked whatever other person came along. And she didn't want to spend the rest of her life that way. The Ferris wheel stopped again. She broke eye contact and looked straight ahead, focusing on her breathing and holding on to Elias. It felt like forever, but it was just a few minutes until it was their turn to get off. Elias held onto her hand as he helped her out of the car, and they walked down the ramp together. Bet you're glad to see the last of that ride, he said, the relief in his tone evident as well. I never thought I would be the kind of adult who didn't enjoy riding. I always have. But after that, I can imagine a scenario where I would never want to do that again. Really? You're not usually that kind of person. You see a challenge and you go for it. He didn't look down at her, but had his phone out of his pocket and was using one thumb to text Arian. His words were said offhandedly, but they inspired her. Not necessarily because she thought she was that kind of person, but because he believed in her, expecting her to be better, and she wanted to live up to those expectations. They were the kind of words that he would often say to her, making her want to be better. Even though he didn't seem to be focusing on her or thinking about it, she was pretty sure he knew that she responded much better to someone's positive belief in her than she did to criticism or exhortation. What? He said as he looked down at her. A little grin turned the corners of his mouth up. What did I say? You know exactly what you said, she said. His little grin became a guilty smile. So? I did a little motivational speaking. I'm good at it. You are. For me, anyway. So that's something I do, right? It was mostly a statement, but his eyebrows were raised, like he was asking. You do a lot of things right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel bad. I was just trying to explain why I made the decisions that I did. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for explaining that. I'm just trying to figure out what I did wrong so I can fix it. That was half the battle, maybe even more, and she appreciated his willingness. For some reason, Carmen's face came into her mind, and she thought that maybe being married to someone like Elias wouldn't be nearly as bad, not even a smidgen, as what Carmen had gone, was going, through. Carmen's husband was not just unwilling to change, he was unwilling to even listen to Carmen say that there might be a problem. Her feelings were not valid. Thank you. I really appreciate you not just listening to me, but hearing me. There was a difference, a big difference, and if that had been a test, Elias would have passed with flying colors. He jerked his head, like he was uncomfortable with praise, or maybe he didn't want to go back to their former conversation. Maybe he was thinking that she was going to reject him eventually, or maybe her not answering his proposal was rejection. Did she want to reject his proposal? She really wasn't sure. She still wasn't when they dropped Arian off later that evening, and he drove Catherine into Prairie Rose, toward her house. Thanks for going with me. Sorry about the Ferris wheel thing. Hopefully the pizza made up for it, Elias offered with a chuckle. Food can make up for pretty much anything. I know. Although I might not remember what kind of food, I'm going to try to do better at that. But I do know that you're pretty attached to your meals. Isn't everyone? Even though he was driving, he lifted a brow at her before looking back at the road and flipping on his turn signal to pull into her driveway. I think you might be a little more than most. If I'm on the phone when it's lunchtime, you're typically up and waiting by the door. I'm hungry. He lifted his shoulder as he turned carefully into her driveway. 
My point. I would be afraid to get between you and your food. It's just another thing we have in common, I guess. He grinned, carefree, as he pulled to a stop in front of her porch. I'll watch while you get in, he said, finality in his voice, like he wasn't going to sit around and talk. Did she have the nerve to broach the subject again? Did she want to? Did she even know what she really wanted to say? Not really. She liked him, and compared to Carmen's husband, he was most definitely a catch. She also believed he truly would work to fix the issues that she'd pointed out. Maybe she was just ashamed that she'd complained so much about him. Or maybe she was still embarrassed about her freak out on the Ferris wheel. Whatever it was, the idea of broaching the subject of him being her husband, or whatever he had said, was just a fleeting thought before she squashed it. Thanks, I had a great time tonight. I appreciate you going with me. Thanks for waiting until I get in. Her words kind of all ran together, and she fumbled for the door latch. As much as she rode in his car, she shouldn't have needed to wonder where it was. See you in the morning. Last time. Last time, she echoed, her heart clenching at the thought. She didn't want it to be the last time they worked together. She didn't want to walk out on her office and never return. She didn't want things to change. But she'd made the decision. She'd set things in motion, and it was too late to stop any of it. So, whether she wanted it or not, that's what was going to happen. She was out and getting ready to shut the door when Elias said, Catherine? Yes? If it's okay with you, don't bring lunch tomorrow, and we'll go out. Okay. She met his eyes the dim glow of the cargo light casting shadows on his angled face. Her heart pinched, and her brain screamed that she was making a huge mistake. She ignored it and slammed the door shut, walking toward the porch with a sick feeling in her stomach. After tonight, seeing Elias's care and concern and the way he'd helped her with her panic attack, she realized she'd gone about everything all wrong and it was too late to change any of it. Chapter 16 Elias walked into the office after having spent most of the morning in the shop working on a broken PTO. It was delicate work and needed to be done right since he didn't want it flying apart and hurting anyone if the job was faulty. Not that he didn't trust his guys, but if he was going to be liable on such a difficult job, he wanted to do it himself. Not the way he wanted to spend Catherine's last day, but it was the way it turned out. As he stepped into their office, he met Chubb on his way out and gave him a quizzical glance. Typically, Chubb wasn't in the office, and it was kind of odd that he'd be coming out as Elias came in. Chubb met his glance without Elias saying anything and he grinned. Just figured with it being Catherine's last day, I had to make sure I got everything that needed to be stored so she can take care of it. Chubb jerked his head at the box sitting on Catherine's desk. She smiled and nodded her head at him as she finished typing, clicking a couple of things on her computer, and then stood. I'm not doing anything special with it, just putting it on the top shelf in the closet. There's some dirt by the front door that can be swept up, and the trash cans need to be emptied, Elias said as he walked in and turned, waiting for Chubb to leave. A little bit of the smirky grin disappeared off Chubb's face. Cleaning wasn't his favorite job, any more than filing papers. Elias wasn't sure whether Chubb was trying to dump work on Catherine or whether the box really needed to be stored, but Elias didn't like his look a look that said he was up to no good. It's as good as done, boss, Chubb said, starting to walk out of the office. Elias wanted to watch him go, but he didn't want Catherine to carry the box over to the closet herself, so he turned, 
seeing that he was already too late and Catherine was almost to the closet door. He hurried over as she balanced the box on her hip, opening the door and stepping inside. The closet wasn't exactly spacious, but it was probably ten feet wide and four feet deep with shelf space along the whole back wall. Catherine turned left and disappeared into the closet, and he hurried after her. She was putting that up on a top shelf. He could lift that for her. The way she was handling it made it look like it was pretty heavy. I've got that, Catherine. Let me, he said as he stepped in the closet, thinking to take the box from her. I think I can get it, she said over her shoulder as he touched her back, letting her know that he was right there. Before she could turn in the tight quarters, the door slammed shut behind them, and somehow it didn't even surprise Elias when he heard the lock click and Chubb laughing on the other side. <laughs> you guys made that really easy. Very funny, Chubb. Let us out, Elias said in his most commanding boss's voice. His gaze, however, was hooked on Catherine. After the episode on the Ferris wheel yesterday, he wanted to make sure she was okay. She'd flicked the light on with her elbow before she walked in, and Elias had just thought to be thankful for that when the lights went out. He supposed it was probably considered intelligent to put the light switch on the outside of the closet, but intelligent people didn't get locked in. I can't hear you. What'd you say? Chubb said, laughter lacing his tone. Elias gritted his teeth, getting ready to raise his voice, irritated that Chubb would do this to Catherine. Although she didn't seem to be showing any signs of the panic that she had yesterday on the Ferris wheel. Elias? Yeah, he said, trying to make his tone devoid of the anger that scratched on the inside of his ribs. I think I'll let you lift the box up after all. He laughed. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I actually was going to put it on the top shelf here on the end. He already had his hand on her back, so he turned his back toward the shelves to try to slide past her. I'm guessing that Chubb probably wants us to beg to be let out, and as much as I want to command him and demand that he do it, 90% of me doesn't want to give him that satisfaction. That's why I said something about the box. I didn't want you doing that either. He huffed out a breath, feeling the box with his fingers as his body brushed by hers. So often they thought alike on things like this. He figured she probably couldn't see his expression in the dark, but he couldn't keep the grin off of his face. If Chubb wanted to upset someone, he'd pick the wrong two people. I think I have it he said with his hands underneath the box. Okay, I'm going to let go and slide out. Sounds good. They slid by each other, him with the box as he lifted it, feeling with his fingers for the shelf and sliding the box back. Did you even look to see what was inside of it? It said on the outside of the box it was spare parts, used, and I assume they were for obscure pieces of equipment that we seldom see. I also assume that Chubb had Brian inventory them before he put them in the box. Although, if he just had me putting this box away so he could trap us in here together, maybe they weren't. I'll straighten it out when I get out. You don't need to worry about it. The last thing you need to do is get into something like this on your last day. This isn't your worry anymore. If you wanted to be technical about it, it had never been her worry. You haven't hired my replacement, or I would train them. He hadn't even really thought of anyone to replace Catherine. No one could. I just haven't found the right person yet. He might as well be honest. Or maybe you're just irreplaceable. She didn't really work for him anyway. Not technically. He heard the knob rattle and figured she was checking to see if Chubb had actually locked it. Locked? Yeah. She shifted some and he took a step toward her, his hand out as he moved slowly. The last thing he wanted to do was ram into her. My eyes are adjusting to the dark a little, 
I think there might be enough light coming around the cracks in the door for us to see a bit. Yeah, Chubb left the light in the office on. I have the flashlight on my phone, except my phone is sitting on my desk. Mine too. He never took it when he was working in the shop, since he would end up just taking it out and putting it somewhere so he didn't crush it or drop something on it. He hadn't picked it up after he walked in, more concerned about getting to Catherine and helping her with the box. I'm sorry about this, he started, unsure what to say. It wasn't like he could fix it right now. Picking locks wasn't exactly his skill set, although if he had a screwdriver, he could take the doorknob off. As soon as he thought that, he remembered that there was an extra toolbox sitting in the corner of the closet. His eyes had adjusted to the light enough that he could grab that screwdriver and probably have the doorknob off in about 60 seconds or less. Did he want to do that? He couldn't believe he was actually considering not. It wasn't like he was lying or anything. She hadn't said, hey, can you get us out of here? She hadn't reminded him about the screwdriver, and he hadn't said there wasn't one. He just wasn't mentioning that he remembered there was. Not your fault. I know how the guys are. I've been around them enough. This is just the way they celebrate my last day of work. Unfortunately, you got stuck in here with me. I'm guessing that Chubb set that on my desk, intending to lock me in the closet the whole time. It was just good fortune. For him, he got you in here too. She laughed a little. If anybody should be apologizing, it should be me. That's very logical. I have to agree with that. Go ahead. Go ahead what? She asked, sounding confused. Go ahead and apologize to me. I'm waiting. There were a few moments of stunned silence before she laughed. I'm sorry. Sorry that you're standing in the closet in the dark locked in with me because this is my last day of work. See, if you hadn't quit, we wouldn't be having this problem right now. I didn't quit. And you can stop rubbing it in. I apologized. The gracious thing to do is to say you accept and that you forgive me. If you don't forgive me, I can't forgive you. She reminded him in a rather scholarly tone. I'm going to forgive you, but I'm going to make you wait a little bit first. After all, I could be eating lunch right now. Oh, that was your stomach that was growling. I was concerned about a monster, but I didn't want to scare you. That's what I like about you. You're so thoughtful. Live and learn from the master, my friend, she said. He sobered. That was one of the things that she'd said he wasn't. Thoughtful. And she really was, monsters aside. Seriously, are you okay? He asked, remembering her panic on the Ferris wheel. Of course, that had been triggered by something that happened last year, and as far as he knew, she hadn't had any incidents involving being locked in closets or happening in the dark. But what did he know? He thought he knew a lot, but he was blindsided by her leaving. He moved a little closer, and at the same time, she turned. Her foot kicked his boot, and her balance wobbled a little. Chapter 17 Elias put a hand up to steady Catherine. Not that there was any place for her to go in the small closet, other than against the door, the wall, or the shelves. But his hand landed on the indent of her waist, and he left it there. The idea of getting the screwdriver faded from his mind as he breathed in the scent of wild fields and sunshine, big skies and fresh wind underlain by the faint whiff of apples. Of course I'm okay. Why wouldn't I be? She asked. Her hand had reached out and landed on his chest when she stumbled. And maybe because he didn't drop his hand from her waist, hers stayed on his chest. Or maybe she wanted it there. Elias almost laughed at the thought. Although, 
He remembered last night she had said that she liked him. Maybe even had a crush on him at one point. Did she still feel that way? She wouldn't be leaving if she did. I was just thinking about last night. I'm never going to live that down, am I? I wasn't tossing it up in your face. I was seriously concerned. This is completely different than that, but it's still something that might give normal people a little bit of fear. Or a lot. I'm sorry. I'm a little sensitive. I know you were just being considerate, and I appreciate it. Did she... Did she just say I was considerate? Oops. She laughed again as he had intended. She'd been right about him needing to be more thoughtful. Surely he could joke about his shortcomings, right? Okay, so I'm a little sensitive about the whole panic attack thing, but maybe you're a little sensitive about the whole considerate and thoughtful thing. I wasn't saying you were the worst person. I know. He shifted. Maybe he wasn't consciously thinking of bringing her closer, but his feet were on the outside of hers, and she seemed to settle more firmly between them. Her breath blew over the stubble on his chin, and her face was close enough in the dim darkness that he could see her eyes shining up at him, the little smile on her face. I, I think I remember hearing you say yesterday that you might have had a bit of a crush on me at one point. Her smile vanished, and he almost wished he could take the words back. But then she nodded and said softly, Yes? That might be true for me as well. Oh? She did sound surprised. Yeah, although I guess it's kind of late for me to be saying that, but I guess it's not too late for me to ask if I could kiss you goodbye. He had no idea where those words came from, other than with her being so close and him standing with his hand on her hip and his other hand itching to wrap around her back and pull her closer. Her hand on his chest, her scent everywhere. All he really was thinking about was kissing her. Maybe not all. He'd been thinking about being thoughtful too. Funny how when someone he cared about, respected, liked an awful lot, showed him an area where he could improve. It made him want to do it. Her fingers curled a little on his chest, and his heart seemed to stop beating. Waiting. What was she going to say? He'd asked a bold question, especially after their conversation last night, and it seemed to come out of the blue, since there had never been anything more than friendship between them. In fact, Last night, she'd been telling him how he hadn't been a good friend. Then today, rather than doing a lot of things to fix his problems, he asked to kiss her. Man, sometimes he just couldn't believe the things that came out of his mouth. Although, he couldn't regret it, since it was what he wanted to do. Without a doubt. Okay. His heart started up again with a rough jerk that seemed to shake his entire chest. He almost choked out a, really? But he stopped himself just in time. He didn't want to act like a 15-year-old having his first kiss. Even if that's how he felt. Maybe it should feel a little odd, kissing someone who had been such a good friend to him. But it didn't. As soon as she said, okay, it felt like the right thing to do. Not to mention he felt relief, like he had taken a chance, gone after something he really wanted, and managed to get it. Now, the pressure was on not messing it up. Although, it was Catherine, and he figured no matter how he kissed her, she wouldn't complain about it, and she would laugh if he ended up being really terrible. As he lowered his head, he said, Suddenly, I'm extremely nervous. Tell me why. Maybe you're feeding off of my nervousness. That's pretty much exactly how I feel. I guess I'm just as excited as I am nervous, though. 
and I think my nervousness is mostly because I don't want to screw this up. Because I really don't want this to be goodbye. Can we analyze the situation after we're done kissing? She asked. I'm pretty sure that's my line. I don't think you have any lines right now. You're supposed to be kissing me. Great. Now she's bossy. You haven't seen bossy. You, however, are procrastinating. Did you change your mind? Her words were light and soft, with a little bit of humor. But on the last question, there was a slight amount of concern. Or maybe fear. No, I told you. I'm nervous I'm not going to do it right. I don't want to mess this up. Then how about I kiss you, and you don't have to worry about anything? Was I worrying? Worrying and procrastinating. It's not a good combination. Then how about I stop doing both and just kiss you? That's a great idea. I think I suggested it about five minutes ago. Wow, there's a whole new side to you I've not seen before. You see it every day. This is me. I know. Getting things done. I guess, I guess I just didn't see you doing it in a romantic way. What? I should just sit here and wait for you to procrastinate all day? Someone's going to have that closet door open before you even start kissing me. And I was kind of hoping it was going to last a little while. So you're saying the way for us to get out of here is for me to start kissing you? Well, if you take most of the day, that's almost bound to happen. I never thought I'd see the day when you complained I was too slow. She must have gotten really frustrated with him because she stood up on her toes, both hands going around his neck, and pulled on his head. Sometimes a girl just has to take things into her own hands. He was mid-grin when their mouths met and their teeth hit and it was a little jarring. She let out a surprised squeak, and he grunted but automatically moved his head a little, and the fit was much better the second time. Much better. In fact, he couldn't remember a better fit, or a better kiss. Not thinking in terms of skill or talent, whatever that was, but in terms of how right it felt, and how good and how much he lost himself in the feel of her fingers on the back of his neck, touching the small hairs there and making him shiver. The movement of her back under his hands, and her breath mingling with his, and his heart trying to escape out of his chest, and the world tilting to the point where he was glad for the solidness of the shells behind his back as he ran a hand over her rib cage and wrapped it around her waist. Her soft sigh and the gentle pressure of her body. Was that long enough? He asked. He didn't know how much later. All he knew was he was breathless and slightly bewildered and pretty much astounded that a kiss from someone he'd considered a good friend and working partner could move his world so much. No. He laughed. I think this is something I'm going to have to build up endurance on. You didn't like it? There was definitely hurt in her voice. Maybe a little fear. Disappointment. No. I meant exactly what I said. I liked it way too much. I feel a little dizzy. I don't recall that ever happening after a kiss before. That seems like something you would see in a movie or something. Oh, you watch romantic movies. No, just, you know, something that might be make-believe or made up. I didn't ever expect to feel it myself. And not only was he astounded by the kiss, here he was explaining how he felt. That was a first, too. Catherine brought out all kinds of odd things in him. She made him better. 
He wasn't sure where that thought came from, but he liked it. Because it was true. It had been true all along. He just never thought about it. Hadn't really noticed. Hadn't been considerate. Speaking of, maybe it was just his imagination that she was breathing a little fast, and he thought maybe, maybe she enjoyed it after all. You okay? Seems to be your favorite question anymore, she said, and she did sound a little out of breath, just as much as he did, which made him smile and rub his cheek against her temple. The last two days have been kind of different. But what I was trying to find out was if you enjoyed that as much as I did. I think maybe more. Her head turned, and she put a kiss on his neck. Her lips, soft and perfect. I guess I'm just wondering if you're as surprised as I am. I think more. It has to be more. This is not something I saw between us, ever. She stiffened some, and he realized how she'd probably taken his words. He wasn't going to lie, but he didn't want her to misunderstand either. It's not that you're not pretty, or that you're not capable, or that you're not really great at what you do. I did notice all of those things. I know you think I didn't. I just... Never thought about telling you. He closed his eyes and pressed his cheek against her temple. I'm sorry. I see now you couldn't know what I thought without me saying anything. You don't have to apologize again. But my point was, because we work together, I guess, because my mind was always focused on work or family or whatever we were doing, I never really thought about this with us. Am I terrible? You hate me? No, of course not. It's just too bad it came too late, you know? His whole heart lurched to a stop, along with all the thought processes in his body. That was the exact opposite of what he was trying to say. He didn't want this to be the end. He wanted it to be the beginning. There was a click, the door yanked open, and a voice said, I thought Chubb was lying when he told me this is where I'd find you two. It was his brother, Preston. Chapter 18 Preston stood staring into the closet. He hadn't thought for one second that Chubb was telling the truth and figured he was going on a wild goose chase, figuring that Elias and Catherine were probably eating lunch somewhere. But he didn't want to leave the shop without at least checking because he had wanted to talk to his brother. He'd also wanted to congratulate Catherine on the sale of her business and on being able to leave and go take care of her aunt. Catherine had been like a sister to him through the years. She and Elias had done everything together and she'd spent almost as much time at his house growing up as his brothers had. Especially after her mom left, and her dad and her brothers were out on the harvest crew year after year. She'd lived with his gram, and she was like a part of the family. Of course he was going to come in and wish her good luck on the last day of her job. This was a surprise, though. Finding her shut up with Elias in the closet. He had thought Elias had the same feelings toward her that he did. A sister. Of course, Elias worked with her and was closer friends with her. But still, he hadn't ever considered anything romantic between them. This is an interesting way to celebrate Catherine's last day on the job, he said, his eyes going from Elias, who looked like he'd just been kissed within an inch of his life, to Catherine, who looked embarrassed. He narrowed his eyes a bit, almost certain that his brother wouldn't have Catherine in the closet against her will. And as he registered the fact that her hands were wrapped around his neck, and even though she looked embarrassed, they seemed reluctant to let go, he decided that she'd been a willing participant. 
he hadn't been this shocked in a really long time. Dude, don't you know you should knock first? It's a closet. You said Chubb said we were in here. So Elias looked like he'd been well and thoroughly kissed, and he also looked extremely happy. Although, there was something lurking in his eyes that said that maybe everything didn't turn out quite the way he wanted. Catherine shifted away from Elias, who didn't seem to want to let her go. I'm sorry, Preston. You most likely weren't expecting to see that. To say the least, Preston said. He opened the door wider and stepped back as they seemed to disentangle themselves from each other, and Catherine stepped out of the closet first. So, you guys locked yourselves in the closet? Maybe he shouldn't ask. Probably he shouldn't be interested. It was just so weird. Catherine and Elias. Best buds, not lovers. Maybe a more pertinent and pressing question is how long has this been going on? Had they been doing it forever and he just hadn't noticed? He wondered if Braxton and Keene, his other two brothers, had any inkling that this was happening. None of your business. Elias walked through and shut the door behind him. His eyes trailed Catherine as she walked to Preston and put her arms around him. Hey, sis, I put some flowers on your desk. I'm sorry I didn't make it until just now, but I got held up at the farm. She stepped back and looked over, her eyes lighting up. Peach carnations, they're beautiful. I heard you say once that you like peach-colored flowers. I hope they're okay. I love them, and I just appreciate you being so thoughtful. Well, I'm going to miss you. I guess your aunt won't be sick forever or laid up or whatever, but it's nice to see you around. You're like one of the family. Thanks, she smiled at him. And since Elias seems like he's being a grouch and isn't talking to anyone, no, this hasn't been going on for a long time. I think Elias and I are probably almost as shocked as you are. Although I'm leaving, so it's not a big deal. Elias's eyes darkened at that, and Preston guessed her leaving was probably the problem. And just to satisfy your curiosity about how that all went down, I think that Chubb just meant to lock me in the closet. You know, rather than flowers, that was my going away gift. Yeah, well, right there could be the reason he's on his fourth wife. Catherine rolled her eyes. Anyway, Elias didn't want to see me have to lift a box up to the top shelf, and he didn't get me stopped before I walked in the closet, so he followed me in. That's when Chubb shut the door. I haven't talked to him, but I'm guessing he was pretty excited to get both of us instead of just me. Oh, he was. He was on his way for a very long, extended lunch break as I walked in. He figured maybe if he took long enough, you would all be calmed down when he got back and he wouldn't get fired. If I thought I could get along without him, I would definitely fire him. But he's a good mechanic. That's probably why he thought he could get away with it, Preston said with a grin. Unfortunately, he's probably right, Elias said, his eyes never leaving Catherine as she moved papers on her desk. Catherine and I were going to go out for lunch. Is what you wanted to talk to me about going to take very long? Preston didn't want to make another trip back to the shop but he could also tell that his brother was not very pleased with the way things had gone in the closet. The kiss, if there'd been one, must have been something, but Catherine had said something after that which must have bothered him. At least, that was Preston's take. You know what? I'll talk to you later. You guys go for lunch. I can hear Catherine's stomach growling from over here. You did not hear that. Catherine said, putting a hand over her stomach and turning to him with surprise in her eyes. You could use that thing as a guard dog, Preston said, his grin widening as her mouth dropped open. 
Are you going to let me get away with talking to your girl like that? He elbowed his brother before he walked away from him. She's not... Preston laughed to himself as he practically heard Elias's teeth snap closed. He wanted her to be. Preston would bet a lot of money on that, if he were a betting man. Yeah, Catherine had gotten over her outrage at his dog comment, and her eyes snapped to Elias. Preston was a little tempted to stop and say that he'd go ahead and join them for lunch. It was bound to be interesting. But no, he probably should stop laughing at them when his own love life was so screwed up. Actually, he'd barely had that thought when he opened the office door on his way out and almost ran into a woman with shoulder-length brown hair, sparkling brown eyes, and a beautiful smile that he had never been able to resist. His heart beat hard in his chest. It was funny that he would run into her here. Maybe not so funny that Carmen would be here, on Catherine's last day, considering that they were such great friends. Although, Carmen hadn't stayed in touch with many of her friends since she'd married the jerk loser she called husband. Suddenly, all the humor that he had been feeling over the situation with Elias and Catherine evaporated. He tried to avoid his heart as much as possible, figuring he'd probably live his life without it. Carmen had made vows, and no matter how big of a jerk her husband was, she wasn't going to break them. That was part of what he loved about her. She was honest and loyal, and even though her husband was a sorry excuse for a man and treated her like dirt, she was almost always smiling, as she had been just now, until she saw him. Excuse me, Eggie, she said, her voice gripping on his backbone, even though it was cool and unemotional. She'd used his nickname, the one she'd had for him years ago. Of course, peep. He used hers as well, noting her tightened lips as he held the door open. She walked by, orange and spice scent drifting back and around, a little more mature than the fruity way she'd smelled in high school. It didn't matter. Both scents were perfect to him. Which is why the minute she'd said, I do, he'd done his level best not to spend any more time in her company than he had to. It was wrong to covet another man's wife. It was the sin he had fought his entire adult life. Chapter 19 Elias walked slowly up his Graham sidewalk. The day hadn't exactly gone the way he planned it. Most days didn't, but this one had been especially off the rails. Some of that had been good. The kiss in the closet, for example. But then Catherine's shocking declaration that it was too late, and that what he had said was a goodbye kiss, but hadn't meant it, turned out to actually be a goodbye kiss. He thought he would have time to straighten things out at lunch, but then Carmen had come, and there had been an emergency repair in the shop, and with most of the guys out at lunch, that had fallen on him, and he'd gone to the shop while Catherine had gone out to lunch with Carmen. He'd gotten the repair done, but Catherine had left for the day. She had her house packed up and was planning on driving to her Aunt Lenore's house this evening. He'd texted her a while ago and asked her to let him know that she got there safely. He didn't typically do that. They texted all the time but he didn't send worried texts. Asking about her safety. Maybe that was part of the neglect. He just hadn't thought about it before. Catherine was quite capable of taking care of herself, although he knew she wouldn't be upset with him checking on her. He wasn't quite sure why he was going to his grams, though. That was just where he'd pointed his pickup when he'd finally gotten done with the emergency job he'd started after lunch. It had been pretty involved, and it was now close to nine o'clock. Maybe Graham wasn't still up, but there was still a light on in her kitchen. 
he knocked on the door before opening it without waiting for an answer. Walking in, he almost closed his eyes at the familiar, comforting scent of her kitchen. Laced with roast beef, onions, and garlic, and a little hint of chocolate under all of it. If he'd come in the morning, it almost certainly would have smelled like bacon and coffee. Graham's house always smelled delicious. Elias, Graham said, looking up from her Bible, which was spread out on the table in front of her, along with a notebook and pen. Setting the pen down, she pushed her chair back. What a surprise. Elias put a hand up, closing the door and standing in front of it. Unaccountably uncomfortable. Which was odd, considering he was just as comfortable in his Graham's home as he was in his own. Please, don't get up. I didn't mean to disturb you. Oh, don't be silly, Graham said, not stopping at all, but standing up and walking over. He returned her embrace before she stepped back and said, There must be a problem. I'm sorry. I guess it's bad if I show up at your house and it's so unusual that you say there must be a problem. I had a visitor earlier today, too, his Graham said, moving the tea kettle to the stove and looking back at him with her hand on the burner's knob. Would you like some coffee? No, you don't need to do that. I wasn't going to stay long. I don't even know what I wanted to talk about. She told me she had a panic attack on the Ferris wheel and that you were instrumental in helping her not be scared. She said that she just felt so out of it. She was afraid she would have passed out and possibly fallen if it hadn't been for you. She was scared, I'll give her that. But she's a smart girl and capable. She would have been fine. And she knows it. She is smart and capable. I didn't know you'd noticed. Graham said, sounding kind of crafty. She lifted her brows and then nodded at the table. You want to sit down for a bit? He jerked his head and went over and sat down to the right of where Graham had been sitting at the head of the table. As she settled in her chair, he said, I guess that's the problem. I have noticed. And it's too late. She is gone. He didn't mean to sound so dramatic. It's kind of the way he'd been feeling all day. Frustrated at the fact that he had an emergency repair come in and take his attention. That Carmen had come. That he'd never gotten to say anything more after their kiss. Not that it seemed it would have made any difference. Catherine had pretty much dismissed him. Maybe she hadn't enjoyed it after all. Maybe it had confirmed to her that she was making the best decision in leaving him. It's not like she's moving to a different continent, his grandma said carefully, her head tilted and her concerned eyes searching his face. He folded his hands together in front of him and stared at them. She might as well be. She's going to be hours away. I can't work until... He looked around. He didn't even know what time it was. Until whenever then drive hours to go see her and be able to work the next morning. Weekends, Graham said, even though she knew exactly what he would say. I work on the farm on weekends. My brothers depend on me. They have all the equipment that needs to be fixed, and they know I'll get it done. He shifted in his seat, feeling like maybe Catherine was more important, but not knowing how to balance that with his responsibilities. Plus, there's often work at the shop to do then, too. Farmers don't quit just because it's the weekend. We're also coming into winter, and those hours turn into a whole lot more in a snowstorm, Graham said. I know. I was thinking that, too. And I don't know how long she's staying. She's going to help Aunt Lenore after her hip replacement, but then she said Uncle Penn isn't in great shape, and she was thinking of staying on for him. Did she sell her house? No, but she closed it up. It makes me think that she's planning on being gone a long time. And the only reason she's leaving us is to help her aunt and uncle? Elias focused on his hands and blew out a breath. 
This had bothered him more than anything else. Although he wasn't even sure he wanted to admit it to his gram. But then, why had he come? She wants a husband and family. She doesn't see there being any eligible men here in Prairie Rose, and she thought she might widen her dating pool, I guess, moving in with her aunt and uncle for a while. And this bothers you? Graham shifted her cup of tea, moving the tag on the tea bag to the back of the cup. I would think you'd be happy for her. Help her, even. Although, I'm not sure I agree. There are lots of single men in Prairie Rose. No one she's interested in, apparently. There was bitterness in his voice. He could hear it. He didn't want it there. If he was bitter, it was only toward himself, for not realizing what he wanted faster and working to get her. His gram gave him an assessing look. I never really thought you liked Catherine like that, she said, kind of slowly, like she was feeling him out. I didn't think so either, or maybe I didn't realize that I did. He flexed his hands then carefully folded his fingers back together. I guess. She said I took advantage of her and didn't appreciate her. She was right. I guess I just assumed she'd always be there. And I liked it that way. And now that she's gone, you're realizing... Graham let the sentence hang, partly because she wasn't entirely sure what he was saying, but he figured it was also partly because she never pried and if he didn't want to tell her, she was letting him know it was fine. Yeah, I'm realizing that now. I've realized. He thought of the kiss. He definitely knew. I know that I want to be more with her, but it's too late. Why is it too late? Graham said. She's gone. He could hardly tell her that he kissed her today and that hadn't changed her mind, so what would? And then we're back to where we started from. She's not going to the ends of the earth. She's just a few hours away. But she might as well be, because I don't have time to go see her. He appreciated the fact that Graham didn't recommend that he call her, text, or that they communicate by social media. He'd already thought of all those things. And while he wasn't big on any of them, he would do it for her. But that wasn't going to be enough. He wanted to see her, romance her. He could hardly do that through text and calls. She already thought he had taken advantage of her, just assumed she was going to be there. Text and calls weren't going to be enough to make all that up to her. Even he as dumb as he seemed to be about relationships, knew that. Maybe you have to make a decision then. He lifted his head slowly, meeting his gram's gaze and trying to figure out what in the world she was talking about. He lifted his brows. What decision would that be? She cleared her throat. <clears> throat> Well, it looks to me like Catherine made a decision about what she wanted, a husband and family. And then she made the changes in her life necessary to get what she wanted, or at least to make getting what she wanted more likely. He nodded. She was right about that. But he couldn't see what that had to do with any decision that he had to make. Why don't you do the same? She said simply. His eyes seemed to flutter, almost like a schoolgirl's. Not that he was noticing because he was trying to figure out what exactly that would entail. He didn't want to be a complete dunce, but... Thankfully, his gram kept going. You seem to want her. I do. He didn't mean so much emphasis to come out in those words, but he meant them with all his heart. Then why are you just sitting there? his gram asked. Man, she was right. Here he was moping around, acting like there was nothing he could do, when the opposite was true. 
He wasn't the kind of guy to just sit around and wait for things to come to him. And yet, he had done everything wrong with Catherine. Hadn't noticed her when she was around, had made her feel like he didn't care about her, and he certainly hadn't meant to do that. And then he just let her leave. And now he was sitting whining and moping about how she wasn't here. You're right. If I want her, she needs to know it. He hadn't chased her, had barely paid attention to her, hadn't made her feel special or wanted or anything. He had the opportunity to do it now. But that would entail... I need to sell my business. His gram raised her brows and tilted her head, a little smile on her lips. I could even call the guy that Catherine sold her business to. They might be interested. It wasn't a little thing to sell a business. Sometimes it took a long time, but he could do it. I could move to where she is. I could... Maybe that's too much? I can't speak for Catherine. Graham leaned forward on the table, resting her arms on the edge and putting both hands on her teacup. But I can tell you she likes you. That was encouraging, especially coming from his Graham. As a friend? Graham lifted her shoulder. That's the way romance starts, isn't it? Most of the time, anyway. You find someone you're able to be friends with. Maybe you don't have everything in common, but you have enough. You like them. They compliment you. You make each other better. You understand each other. Then you build on that. Those are the best romances, the strongest relationships. Wow, he really didn't know anything about any of that. But through all that, it kind of sounded like Graham thought he might have a chance of getting Catherine to think about him as more than a friend. It would be a big gamble, though. Giving up his business? His livelihood? Walking away from everything he had, just hoping that he could win her hand. Hoping that she'd want to have something to do with him, that she'd see him as a potential love interest and not just a friend and business partner. What did he have to lose? His business, sure. But he'd have the money for it. But if he didn't do it, he would definitely not have Catherine. Just in the last two weeks, the idea that she was leaving, that he would hardly see her again, for who knew how long, had shown him that he definitely did not want to lose Catherine. But then another problem popped up in his mind. I've never had a successful relationship. Catherine already told me that I've taken advantage of her. What can I do to show her that I won't? What can I do to convince her that I want her? Or do I want her to decide for herself? He didn't even know. He just knew he didn't want to coerce her into wanting him. He wanted her to choose him but surely there were things he could do to prove that he wasn't going to be what he had been before that had been so upsetting to her. I understand that you might not have confidence in yourself, maybe because you haven't been successful before, but possibly the reason you haven't been successful before is that it wasn't important enough to you. Oh, that could be. In fact, it probably was. He didn't remember having feelings this strong for anyone, or this almost panic feeling with the idea of losing her. He'd never had his heart broken. He'd been disappointed and let down, but in some of his relationships, he'd even been relieved that they'd broken up. But how? What can I do? How do I know she'll like what I do? There aren't any guarantees. You just have to try. Sometimes you fail. Sometimes you succeed. You learn from your failure, and if she likes you, it's not even going to matter. You could give her a box of peanuts, and she could be allergic to peanuts, 
and she would appreciate it because it was a thoughtful gift that came from you. Unless I knew, or were supposed to know, that she was allergic to peanuts. If I hadn't paid attention to her when she had been talking, if I hadn't learned what she liked and didn't like. And there was his problem. He really had not paid attention. You know, Elias, Graham's hand left her teacup and came down, covering the two of his which were clasped together. I think for the most part, electronic media is a bad idea for relationships, especially relationships where we don't really know the person we're talking to. There's too much that you can hide behind a computer or phone screen. Too much you don't really get to know. But you and Catherine already know each other. I wouldn't recommend this to most people, and I don't recommend that it be the only thing that you do, but maybe it would be a good idea for you to send her some emails. See if she'll tell you the things that you've never paid attention to before. Then pay attention now. If you love someone, you want to know about them. You care what they like and what they don't like. Their interests and passions are important to you. And you might not agree with their likes and dislikes, but you know what they are. That was almost exactly what Catherine had said, and he didn't even know what kind of food she wanted to eat. What else? You have to figure out how to spend time with her. That's a big sacrifice for you, and she'll recognize that. If you've neglected her before or taken advantage of her, a sacrifice, a big sacrifice, might help convince her that you've truly changed. Sacrifice, by its very definition, meant something that was probably going to hurt him. I'll see if I can sell the business. I'll move to where she is, and I'll try to make sure that she understands that I've changed. Now I just need to figure out how to change so I actually do it. You're talking about changing the way you treat her, not actually changing your personality, right? Graham asked gently. Yeah, even I know I can't be somebody I'm not just to try to make her fall in love with me. That's not honest. But I can change the way I notice her, what I notice, what I think about, what I focus on what I spend my time on. That shows what's important to me, and if I spend it on her, that will show she's important to me. That's right. You've got it. I don't think you have to worry about being perfect, but those are the basics. I really appreciate you talking to me. I'm sorry I came so late. Sounds to me like I might not be seeing much of you anymore. I'm glad you came. I don't think Catherine will be happy outside of Prairie Rose. I think we'll be back. Together, I hope. He felt confident. She liked him. She'd enjoyed their kiss, he was almost certain of it. And she hadn't had any problems with him, the actual personality that made him who he was. She just had problems with the way he treated her. He could fix that. And he would. It would be a permanent fix, too. Not something he patched together just to get what he wanted and then, after they'd been married a year, started taking advantage of her again. He needed to make sure of that. He didn't want her to marry him and then regret it. Or be unhappy. He wanted her to say that marrying him was the best decision she'd ever made. Whatever he had to fix in his life in order to get her to say that ten or twenty or thirty years from now is what he would do. She meant that much to him. Chapter 20 Hey, Catherine. I know I could text you, and I probably will sometime. But I wanted to send you an email because I had a couple of questions that I was hoping you could answer for me. First of all, it's only November, but you know Christmas is coming up, and I have people asking me what they can get you. I need to know what your favorite color is. 
Sorry, I can't tell you why. Also, just in case anyone who's planning on getting you a gift decides they'd rather get you a gift card, could you tell me what store I should tell them to get it at? I know you always love getting different colored paper clips and sticky notes and pretty staples. I did notice a few things, although all of those things are still on your desk. And by the way, I haven't hired anyone to replace you, so your desk is exactly the way you left it. Anyway, I almost said the office supply store would be a great place to get you a gift card, but I wasn't sure. Maybe you can let me know. After all, since you don't have your business anymore, you might not be buying business things. Business has been booming, but I've been spending a lot of time out at the farm. Not just fixing the equipment that my brothers use to harvest our corn and plant cover crops, but also, Arian and I have been learning how to play chess. Neither one of us has ever played before, and we pretty much had to look every move up on the internet when we first started. Do you play chess? Maybe there's a game that you prefer over chess. So, anyway, I know it's only been a couple of days, but I wanted to drop you a line. I do miss you. A lot, actually. It's still kind of sad to look over at your desk and see it all cleared off. I hope your aunt's surgery goes well, and I hope you know you can let me know if you need anything. Actually, if you'd like me to come sit at the hospital with you, I can do that. Things aren't so busy here that I can't get away for a day. Just let me know. If you'd prefer that I not email you, just say so. I don't have to. I just have a lot of things to talk about. I miss you. Sincerely, Elias. Good morning, Elias. I got your email late last night. You must have been up way past your bedtime. Neither one of us were ever able to stay up late and get up in a good mood in the morning. I'm betting you're grumpy this morning. It's okay. I never minded it when you were grumpy. It was pretty easy to tease you out of it. As long as you had enough coffee. Boy, I hope someone's making coffee for you. You definitely need it. And just because you probably don't remember, I don't drink coffee. It smells good, but the taste makes my tongue want to leave my mouth and get a job driving sled dogs in the Alaskan wilderness. I'm not sure I'm ready to part with it yet, so I haven't started drinking. I can't believe people are thinking about Christmas presents already. It's barely November. Still, of course, I'll answer your questions. And while we're on the subject, of course, your emails don't bother me. I love hearing from you. I'm not exactly lonely here because Aunt Lenore and Uncle Pen are really great, but their house does sit back a little, and we don't really have any neighbors. I've met some people at church, though, and they seem nice enough. My favorite color is aqua, and you probably could have asked Arian. She would know. And you're right about the office supply store. I love going in there and looking at all the fun things that would make my desk happy. I suppose my pen holder is still sitting on my desk, and you'll notice it's full. That was one of the little joys of my day, picking which pen I would use. Silly, but it was just a little day brightener for me. I've been putting together a lot of puzzles with Aunt Lenore, three to be exact, and we're getting faster. So a gift card to a craft store would be great since they have puzzles there. Although, why in the world anyone would be getting me a gift card is beyond me. And just so you don't feel left out, I already know that your favorite color is blue, and if I would get you a gift card, I would do it at a parts store. I know, parts are boring, but it's what you love. As for games, I've never played chess. I think it would be fun, though. Although, I think I might have to practice on my own a little, because you and Arian will beat me for sure unless I at least know the basics. Maybe Uncle Pen will play with me. I think he would enjoy a game like that. I think I like card games best, though. Remember when we were teens how we used to sit and play cards, especially on winter nights as the snow came down? 
Thanks to your family, I have some really great memories. Do you have plans for Thanksgiving? You're not going to try to make sweet potato casserole again, are you? That was probably one of the biggest holiday disasters I've ever experienced. We are laughing about that now, right? Thanks for writing. Catherine Hey, Catherine. No, no. I don't think we're laughing about the sweet potato casserole yet. That was probably the biggest holiday disaster. Not just in our family, but in the state, maybe? I've always said, if food catches on fire, it's bad. But when it explodes, now that's a disaster. I'm not sure we actually did get it all off the top of the oven. Although, it was awfully nice of you to help me do that Thanksgiving evening. I know that's not exactly the family time that you were thinking you were going to get when you spent it with us instead of hanging out with your dad and brothers. Thanks for that. You're right about my favorite color and also about the parts. It made me feel like I'm kind of boring. Can we still be friends? Actually, I was... Well... Maybe I shouldn't say this in the email, but I was really hoping that maybe we could think about or, you know, try just for a bit and see if it works out being kind of more than friends. Okay, I admit I can't figure out what wording I want to use in that paragraph, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is. That's me stumbling and bumbling around, the same way I'd be doing it if you were standing in front of me. It's the kind of question that makes me nervous. But I just want an honest answer. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. I know you're much more considerate than I am that way. And you're right. I think you saw through my questions. I wanted to know what your favorite color was, but I was too embarrassed to admit that I'd known you for all those years and had no idea. Also, I wanted to get you a gift but I didn't know what store, so I figured if I asked about the gift card, I would at least get pointed in the right direction. They were both bad ideas. I can see that now. I'll just come straight out and say, you're right. I don't know as much about you as I should, and I was hoping to get to know you better. That's the main reason for the emails. That, and I might have mentioned this before, I miss you. I think I better stop there because while I had the biggest food holiday disaster ever, you were the cause of the disaster that almost sent someone to the ER. Not to rub it in or anything. Okay, this is the email where I came clean. Hopefully you don't quit talking to me. Take care. And I hope Aunt Lenore does well in her surgery today. Your friend, Elias. Dear Elias, I can't believe you'd bring that up. Okay, I admit, after the fact, it's kind of funny. But it could have been a terrible disaster. Who keeps sticks of dynamite in with regular benign fireworks? The Emerson brothers, that's who. How was I to know the difference? Thankfully, you were not far from me, saw what I had done, and grabbed that baby and chucked it into the cornfield. I'm not sure Braxton was entirely happy with the fact that there was a big gaping area with no corn growing the rest of that year, but I sure was happy to have all of my fingers, toes, and my life as well. So, thank you for that. And, you're right, that's far worse than the whole sweet potato casserole episode. At least your explosion was contained in the oven. Okay, on to the more serious matters. I admire your bravery. It's bigger than mine. Maybe I wouldn't even be here. Or maybe I would have moved Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn to my house in Prairie Rose where I could care for them if I had been brave like you. First of all, I'm not holding anything against you. I'm not expecting you to be perfect. I've never expected you to be perfect. In fact, I never really minded too much the things we talked about. 
until I realized that I was getting older and I wanted more, and that I'd settled for hoping that one day you would notice me. And maybe I let opportunities go by that I shouldn't have. So the idea that I'm upset is wrong. It was just me knowing that I needed to go after what I want. Now, with that said, you can ask me whatever you want to, and you don't have to make up any stories about someone else wanting to know it. I promise you I'll tell you whatever you want to know. And just for the record, I don't expect you to remember everything I've ever said. I suppose maybe I just wanted to see that you care somehow. That was what I wanted. That I guess when someone knows a lot about someone else, it shows that they paid attention. And to me, that says caring. Maybe it doesn't to you. So I guess that would lead me to ask what makes you think that someone cares about you? If it's not knowing your favorite color and what you like to eat and what you're passionate about, what can someone do that makes you think they care? And now for your other question, the one about being more than friends. I would like that. A lot. I said that I moved out of Prairie Rose because there weren't any eligible men, which wasn't true. Well, it was true, just not the whole truth. I had to move because there weren't any eligible men who could hold a candle to you. There. That's me being brave. Also, in family news, Aunt Lenore made it through the operation, beautifully. She did have some trouble with some of the medication they gave her, and they kept her in the hospital the next day. That's why I didn't write sooner. With being with her and running home twice a day to make sure Uncle Penn has taken his medicine in the morning and evening and had something to eat, I was pretty busy. She got home today, and her pain is managed, although not completely gone. I know it will be just a short time and the hard part will be over but I'm not sleeping much at night. I think I will be staying here for Thanksgiving. Aunt Lenore won't be able to drive, and it's not comfortable for her to ride right now. Love to hear how things are going on the farm and with your business and how everyone's doing. Yours, Catherine. Dear Catherine, I just want to say that if the sweet potato casserole had picked the wrong time to explode, it could have been a catastrophe. Wrong time being when someone was opening the oven door to check on it. If I laugh about that, you need to be able to laugh about the explosives. Laugh and learn, right? I know you agree. A sense of humor isn't something you've ever struggled with. Actually, I don't know that you struggled with much. Maybe your family. Maybe that's why my neglect was such a big red flag for you. Because your family has neglected you. I don't mean to criticize them. You know I admire your dad and respect your brothers, and I know you do too. But you got left out a lot. That was to the Emerson brothers' benefit, since that meant we saw you even more. None of us would complain about that. So, if you're not going to be upset with me for not knowing all of your favorites, could you just list them all for me? In your next email? That way, I'll have them all in one place and can refer back as needed. I memorize things fairly easily, and that will be something I will work on. Okay, I'm a man, and even I can see that is not the slightest bit romantic. Never mind. I'll just keep asking you a little bit at a time and hope that some of them will stick. You're right. Part of showing caring is interest. My interest in you shows that I care about you. And if I'm not paying attention to what you like and what you don't like, what you're passionate about, then I don't really care, do I? There's the answer to your question, by the way. Interest. That shows you care about someone. Also, I think, time. When you take time to be with someone, that shows you care. Maybe that's why I thought our relationship was just fine the way it was. 
You always had time for me. You made time. I was a priority. And if you're being fair, you know that that's true about me for you as well. I always made time for you. I might not have known what you wanted when we got there, but I went, enjoying the time we got to spend together. That doesn't exonerate me, I know, but it does put a little bit of a different spin on things. Just some things are a little more important to me than they are to you, and vice versa. Again, now that I know, I can fix it. Of course, you haven't spent much time with me lately, so I'm starting to feel a little neglected. Just saying. Actually, I'm mostly kidding. I love that you're helping your aunt and uncle, even though it did take you away from me. So, more than friends. We're in agreement on that. I have to admit, it makes me feel a little nervous because I was comfortable in our relationship, and this is changing things. I think it'll be a good change. In fact, I know it will be. But you know, change is hard sometimes. I guess this is where I ask you, can I take you out? Fondly, Elias Chapter 21 Elias stepped up on the porch steps, a bouquet of fall flowers in his hand. He was over thirty, and this was the first time he'd ever bought flowers for a girl. Catherine was totally worth it, but he wasn't sure whether he'd done it right or not. Orange was not her favorite color, but it was the color of the season, and he thought the bouquet was beautiful. But it wasn't his opinion that mattered. He blew out a breath, wiped his hand down his jeans, and knocked on Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn's door before gripping the vase again with both hands. She hadn't answered his last email, and he wasn't sure what that meant other than she was busy. She had sent him a quick text and said her dad and stepmom and her five older brothers were coming to eat at noon on Thanksgiving, and she would be busy not just taking care of Aunt Lenore, but cleaning and getting ready for a lot of guests and making food as well. Elias had never missed a holiday with his family, but Catherine needed help, and he was pretty sure none of her brothers were going to do it. They weren't bad men. Just men. And they hadn't really had a maternal figure in their lives much and maybe didn't realize how much they took advantage of and neglected Catherine. Funny, now that Elias could see how he'd not treated her right, he could also see how it was something her family had done as well. Elias! Catherine exclaimed as she opened the door. There was a big smile on her face and none of the awkwardness that he thought might be there after he ended his last email with the question, wanting to take her out. She seemed to be receptive to his advances, but maybe he was moving a little too fast. Or maybe things didn't come across the way he'd thought in emails. Her eyes had gone to his face, then dropped to his hands, where the big vase of flowers covered most of his chest. Those are gorgeous she said, with maybe not quite as much enthusiasm in her voice as what he had been hoping for. They're for you. Her brow shot up, and her eyes snapped to his face before she looked over her shoulder, then back at him, and he thought she almost pointed to her chest. Me? That made him laugh. <laughs> yeah, who else would they be for? Aunt Lenore? She lifted a shoulder. Lots of people have been dropping flowers for her, especially when she was in the hospital, but the first two days when she came home as well. Okay, I guess that makes sense. But no, these are for you. Just, just because I like you. Wanted to see you smile. That was so lame. But it was the truth. No point in him trying to act differently than what he felt. He liked her, and it was true. He wanted to see her smile. The smile that spread over her face when he said that was much bigger than the smile that had been on her face when she'd seen the flowers. That, that is romantic, 
she said, a little bit of wonder in her voice, like she hadn't expected that from him. And why should she? He'd never been like that with her before. Never really been like that with anyone before. I guess it's not easy to talk about how you feel. Sometimes I can't really put it into words. Most of the time, I don't even think about it. But I have been lately. He hated this vulnerable feeling, the feeling that he was saying stupid stuff, but all of the dumb stuff that was coming out of his mouth was making her smile, and maybe it was good for him to say. I, I have to admit I'm surprised. But the flowers are beautiful, and the feeling behind them even more so. Her smile was huge, but he felt sappy. Still, for the life of him, he couldn't change it. Are you gonna let him come in? A man's voice said from behind Catherine's shoulder before a bald head appeared behind her and bushy eyebrows lowered over deep brown eyes until Uncle Penn recognized Elias. Elias, Uncle Penn said as Catherine stepped aside. Good to see you, Uncle Penn, Elias said, carefully balancing the flowers in one hand as he shook Uncle Penn's hand. It's been a while, Uncle Penn said, putting his arm around Catherine and squeezing. I'm glad you let your sidekick come see us for a bit. She's been a big help. I don't get around like I used to, and Aunt Lenore has really needed it. She's not really my sidekick. She's more like... Elias's voice trailed off. He would probably be more Catherine's sidekick than the other way around. But Catherine shook her head. I'm pretty happy being called your sidekick, she said, lifting a brow. Why don't you come in? Uncle Penn's right. I shouldn't have had you standing on the porch all that time. Come on in and say hello to my wife. Aunt Lenore will be happy to see you. You have a little time to chat before the mob descends tomorrow. My family is the mob. Catherine said with a chuckle at Elias. And by the way, nice flowers. Are they for me? Uncle Penn said, nodding at the bouquet Elias still clutched with both hands. No, these are for the lovely lady who's been taking care of your wife. I thought she might need some flowers of her own. Those are nicer by far than anything we have. Why don't you set those in the middle of the table for tomorrow's meal? Uncle Penn said waiting for them to walk in and closing the door behind them before using his walker and hobbling along beside them as they made their way through the foyer and back into the hall to the kitchen. I think I will. Looks like they need a little bit of water first, Catherine said. Aunt Lenore is sitting in her chair in the living room. I think she'll like to see them too. I'll go in the living room and wait on you then, Uncle Penn said. He turned off to the right, where Elias could hear the TV coming from the open doorway of the living room. I thought you might need some help getting a meal ready for all the people that are coming tomorrow. Catherine walked in the kitchen door and looked over her shoulder. Thank you. She didn't seem to look extremely tired, but she did look relieved. Aunt Lenore has been stressing about it some, and I've been doing everything I can. Her surgery was long enough ago that she's starting to get around pretty well, but I was afraid she would overdo it, so I told her I would handle it all. That's a lot to handle. Sure is. But if she overdoes it, she'll be in a lot of pain and won't be able to enjoy Thanksgiving. Not to mention she might have a setback, and she's been doing so well. Well, as soon as I set these down, you can put me to work. I cleaned the house today, and the bathrooms, and a couple of rooms upstairs in case anyone needs to change or lie down. Aunt Lenore insisted. She walked to the sink and turned the spigot on, holding the vase under it and filling it to the top with water. Looks like you started paring potatoes. I have. And I'm sorry, I wanted to respond to your email, but it's just been so busy. Not a big deal. We can talk about it while we get the meal ready unless you want to talk about something else. She turned around, her head tilted. You've changed. 
Her brows were drawn, like she was trying to put her finger on exactly what was different. I missed you, but maybe that's not exactly it. With you gone, I thought about all the things you had said, and I realized so many of them were right. But there's no point in realizing that you're right unless I'm going to do something about it, right? I guess. She didn't sound totally convinced, or maybe she just wasn't sure what to say since she had set the flowers on the table and seemed to be fumbling with the leaves. Do you want me to carry them into the room? He asked, gently, not wanting to push her, but determined that whatever she did wasn't going to affect what he did. He had changed because he'd realized she was right, not because he was trying to get somewhere with her. If this wasn't what she wanted, them to be together, that would have to be fine. He'd be disappointed, of course, but it would be fine. It still didn't change the fact that he had been inconsiderate and selfish and self-centered, and he wasn't going to be that anymore. As much as he could keep from it, he wasn't expecting himself to be perfect. No one was. Would you please? I know that they will make Aunt Lenore smile. Her lips lifted a little. Actually, just seeing you will make her smile. She's always had a special place in her heart for you. She might be my aunt, but I think she likes you more than she likes me. That's because I eat more than you do. She laughed. <laughs> You're probably right about that. One of Aunt Lenore's favorite pastimes is feeding people. It's just about killing her not to be able to be out here doing the meal preparations. But being on that leg for too long wouldn't be good for her. He took the flowers as she moved around the table, leading the way out of the kitchen. He followed her back into the hall and into the room where Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn waited with the TV on mute. Oh, Elias, they're gorgeous! Aunt Lenore exclaimed, looking at the flowers from her recliner. Come here and give this old lady a hug. I'm jealous. Catherine is such an attentive boyfriend. You didn't tell me, Catherine, that things had changed between you two. Elias reached down and hugged Aunt Lenore while Catherine fidgeted in his peripheral vision. I have to find out when the guy brings flowers that you have a boyfriend, Aunt Lenore said as soon as he'd straightened back up. Well, she said, and then she lapsed into silence. It's my fault. Elias moved closer to Catherine, although he didn't touch her. I don't even know if boyfriend is the right word, but it's just taken me a long time to figure out that... Actually, that's not really true. It took Catherine leaving for me to realize how much she meant to me. I just kind of assumed she'd be there and kind of took advantage of her, kind of had all the benefits of her being around all the time, without me having to exert myself at all. And when she left, I realized there was a pretty big hole in my life. It's a hole that not just anyone can fill. He wasn't used to talking like that, especially not in front of people. But if Catherine meant that much to him, he needed to be willing to be uncomfortable for her. He wanted her to know just how much she meant to him. I see, Aunt Lenore said, nodding her head and looking like she really did see. There was a little smile that turned her lips up, and she nodded approvingly at Catherine. I've always liked Elias, Catherine, she said, but I like him even more now. I like what I'm hearing. Elias's fingers tightened around the vase. He wanted Catherine to say something, anything, let him know that he wasn't making a total fool out of himself. But she didn't. So he turned back to Aunt Lenore and said, you look like you're feeling pretty good. No pain? No pain. The therapist has been in, and Catherine has made sure I've done all of my exercises and followed his instructions to the letter. She's kept track of my medicines and made sure that I exercise exactly how much I'm supposed to. But she won't let me overdo it. And everyone I've seen, from the nurses to the therapist to the folks who take my blood, have said that my care is excellent and I am recovering better than expected. 
It's really killing me to not be in the kitchen, though, she added, almost under her breath. Elias grinned. Next year, you'll be as good as new, and this will all be water under the bridge. That's true, but a lot of this has fallen onto Catherine's shoulders, and it's a lot of work for her along with taking care of me. Maybe later you can make sure you take her for a little walk. I think that's a pretty good idea, Elias said. Catherine shifted and moved away from Aunt Lenore. I think we'd better get back out to the kitchen and keep working. I'll be in in a little bit to get your meds and then help you get ready for bed. Thank you, sweetie, Aunt Lenore said, patting Catherine's hand as they turned to walk away. Elias stopped in the dining room, setting the flowers on the table, which was already set for Thanksgiving dinner. It looked like Catherine had been pretty busy, and she must have been exhausted, although she seemed relaxed and calm. Sometimes things got pretty chaotic at his house around Thanksgiving, when there was a lot of work to do and a lot of people coming and a lot of pressure. He loved that Catherine didn't seem to let it bother her. She'd always been a steadying influence, whether at home or work. He couldn't believe he hadn't noticed. He just hoped it wasn't too late. Chapter 22 It turned out they never did get that walk, but they did get the stuffing mixed and the turkey ready to put in the oven at three o'clock in the morning, which Elias had volunteered to do. Catherine had been relieved when they'd been able to get the potatoes pared. It was cool enough for the pot to sit outside all night. They'd have a few things to do in the morning, but the pies were made, and she felt like they were in pretty good shape. Still, it was eleven o'clock before Elias and she stood at the door to the kitchen, surveying the clean area, and she let out a sigh of relief. I'm so glad you came. I wouldn't be done by now if you hadn't. You had things pretty well in hand. I have to say, it took longer than I thought it would for you to get Aunt Lenore ready for bed. If you hadn't had to do that, you would have been fine without me. And that's the whole reason I'm here, she said with a smile. So what time's your family supposed to get here tomorrow? He asked as she turned and walked out, and he hit the lights and followed her. Sometime late morning. I don't think they're staying, since they're going to my stepmother's family's house for the evening meal. You're not going? No. She had walked down the hall and stopped with her hand on the banister, one foot on the stairs. I'll stay with Aunt Lenore if you want to go. If I had known that, I might have taken them up on it. She looked up at him. I'm a little sad. I guess, I guess sometimes I don't feel very close to my family. And even though my stepmom is kind of new, it would be nice to get to know her. If you change your mind and you want to go, I'll stay. I appreciate it. She had no idea that he had been going to come, and she'd been focusing on all the things that she needed to get done and hadn't really thought too much about how she felt. But now, tiredness was her main feeling. But after that... It really means a lot to me that you came today, and that you're staying tomorrow. I know your family always has a big meal, and as far as I know, you've never missed it. The fact that you're willing to miss it and spend it with me says a lot. You're worth it. His words were said simply, but there was feeling in them, something Elias had never allowed in his voice before. It made something curl in the pit of her stomach, just like it had been curling earlier when he'd said all of those unfamiliar things about how he felt. It also made the email he'd written and the question he'd asked come to her mind again. She probably could have ripped off an answer. Surely she'd had enough time to tap out a few words on her phone. But she hadn't known what to say. She wanted to go out with him. But she'd wanted it for so long, and he hadn't seen her, hadn't noticed her. 
And now that he had, there was a part of her that didn't want to make it easy for him. About that question I asked in the email, he began. Tempted to run up the stairs, knowing he wouldn't follow her since he was staying on the couch for the night, she steeled herself and lifted her chin. Can I say something without you getting upset with me? Even though it's probably something that you have every right to get upset with me about? She asked. Is that a trick question? Or was that two trick questions? I didn't mean it as a trick question. It kind of came out that way. I just know I need to say something, and I know I'm being immature. I don't think I've ever seen you be immature. Trust me, you haven't been looking very hard. Ouch. I'm sorry. That wasn't a kick, I promise. I just know that I'm not nearly the person I want to be. But I want to be honest with you. I actually had a crush on you for a long time. The hall light was on, and she didn't have any trouble seeing his brows rise. It honestly surprised her that he hadn't known. For years. In fact, probably since high school. I just kept thinking you'd notice me. That no one could like you like I liked you. And that eventually you'd like me back. You dated all those other girls. And of course, none of them ever amounted to anything for you. She smiled a little bit at that and had to add. Which I probably shouldn't admit that I was pretty happy about. I'm happy about it now, too. I never really got upset about it. I know. Then she had to breathe and look away. I know. And that just said to me that you really weren't into them. But you weren't into me, either. So this went on for a lot of years? Yeah, I guess. I guess if I'm really being honest, it probably has gone on for a decade. Or maybe more. And then one day I just said to myself that you would never like me as more, and I just needed to deal with it. And ever since then, I've tried to make myself not like you. Not that way. And I guess there's a part of me that doesn't want to give in now. Isn't that terrible? She quit talking in bitter lip. She didn't want to hurt his feelings. But she wasn't ready to give in on the basis of a few flowers and a nice evening. She really appreciated the fact that he didn't start talking right away. He looked down, and her heart clenched a little because she thought she might have hurt his feelings. Disappointed him. Neither one of those things were things she wanted to do. Finally, he shifted, looking at his hand still on the banister. I get that. You didn't say it, but I guess for a lot of years, I've hurt you. Just hearing him say that made the back of her throat squeeze together. She swallowed. She wasn't going to cry. Not now. I guess, sometimes when we're hurt, we want to lash out. And you never did. I admire that. Swallowing wasn't helping and tears filled her eyes. She lifted her chin. When we're hurt, it feels like you want the other person to suffer like you did. Or maybe it's frustrating because you hoped for so long, then you gave up. And to just walk into my arms because I've decided I want to be together, finally, would feel like making things too easy for me. I didn't suffer like you did. She didn't like what he was saying. She didn't want to be the kind of person that made someone else suffer just because she did. But at the same time, she supposed he was probably right. The relationship didn't feel fair or equal right now because she'd put so much into it and he hadn't. I'm not saying that to try to get you to change your mind. In fact, I was just saying that to let you know I understand. Am I right? She nodded her head, not trusting herself to speak. I want you to know things are changing. I have changed. I probably won't be perfect, 
but I don't want you to be the one that's putting more into this than me. I'm going to do everything I can to beat you at being nicer, at putting more into our relationship, at being considerate, at being thoughtful. I want to beat you at all of that. She smiled at his terminology. What a great competition. I guess, I guess even thinking about how I feel is a little foreign to me. You know that. Definitely, saying feelings out loud is not just foreign. It's uncomfortable. I know, I know. She had interrupted him. She had to let him know that she understood the effort that he was going to. I don't mean to knock all the effort that you put into tonight. But one day of effort, flowers, a little bit of help with dinner, a few pretty words, doesn't make up for years. I guess not. He was so right. She wanted him to suffer, even while she loved him. But the two ideas didn't fit very well in her head. After all, if she loved someone, she definitely should not want him to suffer. What kind of person did it make her that she did? Immature. You don't have to answer right now, but I was serious about wanting to take you out. I'm serious about wanting to... court you. Because that's what I'm thinking. I'm not interested in dating just for the fun of it. It didn't take me too long to figure out after you said you were leaving that I didn't just want to be friends. I want to be more. And my thought is, I want to be more because I want to marry you. He put a hand up. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I'm not popping the question right now, and I'm not expecting an answer. I just wanted you to know what my intentions are. Catherine almost didn't realize her hand went to her chest. She managed to contain her gasp. She certainly hadn't been expecting that. But it was just like Elias. He didn't mess around. And just like him deciding to change, when he decided to do something, he put everything into it, all of his analytical mind, figuring out how to make it happen. Now, I'm going to go grab my blankets and lie down for a bit. I don't want to sleep through my alarm at 3 a.m. I know you won't, she said. Those words came easy because Elias didn't shirk his responsibilities, no matter what. I'll see you in the morning. She looked into his eyes, that curl in her stomach somehow tightening and expanding at the same time but she forced her voice to sound normal, and she said, In the morning. She hadn't done right by him. Not today. She needed to go upstairs and figure out how she could tell Elias she'd been wrong. She didn't want to punish him. She just wanted to love him. Chapter 23 Catherine. Melinda, Catherine's stepmother, said as she breezed through the kitchen doorway, her arms spread out wide. She made a beeline toward Catherine. Catherine, the mixer in one hand, a stick of butter in the other, just kind of stood still as she was wrapped up in a hug and the smell of oranges engulfed her. Melinda, she said. Sorry, my hands are full, but it's great to see you. Oh, do go on, Melinda said as she stepped back and waved in the air as though waving away any apologies Catherine might have. I'm just so glad we get to see you. It's good to be here. Good to see the family, Catherine said as her dad filled the doorway. Hey, kid, he said, and Catherine jerked her chin at him, feeling let down even though she knew better than to get her hopes up. Her dad hadn't seen her for eight months and they barely talked in all that time. But he didn't exactly seem like he cared. And Hey Kid was about the best she was going to get. He probably wouldn't say anything to her the rest of the time they were here. Her brothers strode through the door, having stopped to see Aunt Lenore on their way, she supposed. They all gave her a hug and greeted her. 
She managed to get the butter on the counter and let go of the mixer long enough to hug them all back. She loved her family, even if she didn't feel like she fit in a lot of times. But she tried not to think about that now, as there was a lot of boisterous talking and backslapping, and then Melinda raised her voice above all the hubbub and started issuing orders about what each brother could carry to the dining table. Hey, sis, Monroe said, leaning down and talking in her ear. I missed you. Glad you're here. Monroe was closest in age to her, and the one she'd played with the most growing up. Although, he'd barely been ten when her dad had started taking him on the harvest crew. I missed you too, she said, biting back tears. Happy tears mostly because she missed having family time, missed being part of the big, happy group. She felt a hand on her shoulder and turned, looking up into Elias's concerned eyes. You okay? She nodded. He searched her eyes, not smiling, until he finally nodded. I'll go ahead and finish these potatoes. I'll throw the butter in, she said, picking it back up from the counter, just as Melinda came over and handed her a knife to chop it up. I was talking to Aunt Lenore, and now that we're home from Harvest Crew and we're not going anywhere else for the winter, your dad and I decided... Rather than taking our camper and going to Florida like he usually does, we'll stay here and I'll take care of Aunt Lenore, so you can go back to Prairie Rose and keep your business going. Catherine's insides froze. She hadn't told anyone in her family about selling her business, although Melinda had offered to take over the repair scheduling, since she knew Catherine was going to be taking care of Aunt Lenore. Oh, you don't need to do that, Catherine said not wanting to get into the whole I sold my business speech. No, I insist. I've already talked to Aunt Lenore about it, and it's settled. Your dad and I will be staying here, and maybe we'll even get to see you some over the winter. Melinda acted like she actually wouldn't mind seeing her. It made Catherine pause and fight the tears that had threatened since her family showed up. I think all of your brothers, except Truman, are going to South Africa. So we might even see him some. That would be nice, she said, although the words felt wooden. She'd sold her business. She was planning on staying with Uncle Penn and Aunt Lenore, and she had even considered talking to them about staying after Aunt Lenore was back on her feet. Except she'd come, thinking she would be broadening her dating pool but she hadn't met anyone who was even close to being a prospect. Still, she had nothing to go back to. Here, Chris, Melinda said to her dad. Let me carry that platter of turkey in, and you grab that container of gravy. Melinda was just the person to be marrying into a family of five boys. Catherine had always gotten pushed aside. She just wasn't loud enough to compete or maybe aggressive enough. But Melinda held her own and even managed to stay ahead. Catherine had to admire that. She'd only met her stepmother at the wedding, and while she hadn't taken an immediate dislike to her, she hadn't talked to her enough to feel like she'd gotten to know her. So it was a pleasant surprise as they sat at the table and ate Thanksgiving dinner to find that she actually liked Melinda. Her dad obviously idolized her, and the boys respected her. Her eyes kept going to Elias, though, and he didn't seem to take his eyes off of her from where he sat across from her at the table. Melinda and her dad stayed long enough to help with the dishes and put everything away. Her brothers helped clear off the table and talked to Aunt Lenore and Uncle Penn some before they made their way out. As Melinda was leaving, she said, are you sure you don't want to come and eat at my family's? I'd love it if you would. I don't want to leave Aunt Lenore. I appreciate it, but you are going to take that walk you never took last night. Aunt Lenore called from the living room where she was sitting. I'll make sure she does, Elias said, coming up behind her and putting a hand on her shoulder. Melinda looked at his hand, and then she looked up at Elias. 
You're the one that's in business with Catherine, Melinda said, her brows raised. Yeah. Elias didn't correct her on the wrong verb tense, and Catherine didn't correct him for not correcting her. I've heard a lot about you from Catherine's dad and her brothers. They say you're a good guy. You have a nice family, and you've taken Catherine under your wing when her family couldn't. We've always enjoyed having her around. She's a great person and has always been a good friend. I'm hoping she'll be more soon. Catherine wanted to fidget at that. She wasn't sure she was ready for the world to know that she wanted to be more than with Elias, although she was ready to talk to him about it, to apologize. On their walk. I think we'll be seeing you around a good bit this winter. I look forward to it, Melinda said, before wrapping her arms around Catherine, and this time Catherine could hug her back. Take care of yourself, Catherine. I've always wanted a daughter, and I'm really hoping we'll get to spend some time together while we're home. I hope so, too, Catherine said, and found she meant it, to her surprise. They walked out, and Elias squeezed her shoulder with the hand that was still resting on it. Do you want to take a walk? I would love to, she said and she meant that, too. Chapter 24 Elias held the door open as Catherine came out behind him. She'd been quiet, more so than usual, with the hubbub around the table. Elias really liked her brothers, but it irritated him the way they left her so easily, like she didn't fit in because she was a girl and they didn't really care. They were just being men, but they hurt Catherine's feelings. It wasn't hard for him to see that now. But he hadn't really seen it before, and it definitely hadn't occurred to him that he should maybe try to do something about it. Not until he was sitting at the table and wishing there was something he could do. I don't think your dad knows how to relate to you. He closed the door behind them and felt rather brave when he took her hand before starting down the steps. She allowed it, allowed their fingers to slide together, allowed his hand to clasp around hers, and he almost closed his eyes. Whether it was relief or whether it was just he wanted to enjoy that feeling, he wasn't sure. I suppose you're right. I used to think he didn't like me. And then I used to tell myself I didn't care. And then I used to wish I was a part of your family, with a grandma and a mom or even the brothers. I don't care. Just a family, you know? It occurred to me as I was sitting at the table that your family has treated you an awful lot like the way I did. And no wonder it was hard on you. She tugged on her hand a little, and he squeezed. But then he loosened his grip. If she wanted to pull her hand away, he wasn't going to stop her. But she didn't, and they turned and started up the road. There was a farm a quarter of a mile up the way, and a few houses scattered in cornfields for the next mile or so before the cornfields took over completely. A nice, private place to walk once they got past the farm. I guess, she said, referring to the fact that he had neglected her or marginalized her, just like her family had. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to fix it. But I just wanted you to know that I never did that on purpose. I don't think your brothers do it either. I could be wrong since I've never talked to anyone about it, but I think they just figured you were fine. Since you didn't complain, didn't say anything, and they're just typical men. They don't sit around thinking about people's feelings. They just, just think about their work and the things that are important to them, and unless a problem waves itself in their face, they don't think to look around and see that there might be someone close to them that's hurting because of them. That's the way he'd been, anyway. I guess maybe over the years I've kind of come to that conclusion, that I could open my mouth and say something, and until I do, 
I won't really know whether they'll do anything to fix it or not. But I suppose sometimes it's just nice to have someone look at you and see you rather than you having to tell them. Is that terrible? No, I don't think so. I guess I kind of get it. You want someone to notice you because they notice you, not because you tell them to notice you. That was a little confusing, but yeah. Sometimes it's just not realistic, even though that's what you want. I suppose I figured that out. I don't hold anything against my family or my brothers or my dad. And it sounds like Melinda really does want to have a relationship with me, which I think I could kind of get excited about. But I'm almost afraid to. I would say you're better off to not live your life from a place of fear. What's the worst thing that could happen? It just might hurt when she doesn't do what I'm hoping. But that's just part of life. True. Still, I'm very glad that you said something to me and opened my eyes. I just want you to know, I'm changing because I want to. Because I care about you. Because it matters to me how you feel. It mattered before, but it wasn't something I thought about. Does that make sense? She nodded as they walked along, and he thought maybe she saw what he was saying. That reminds me of what we were talking about last night, she said. About how I'd suffered for years, and you felt it was fair that you suffer a little too. And I have to admit, you're right. I did want you to suffer. But I also need to say, I love you. And I don't think that's what love is. I don't want you to pay indefinitely. I don't want you to do some kind of penance before I accept you. If you want a relationship, I'm in. They'd reached the barn, long and low, which was situated right along the road. And a man came out the door at the end, looking like he was carrying something in his coat and walking just ahead of them. He almost turned toward the house when he seemed to see their movement out of the corner of his eye, and he jerked his head in greeting. Happy Thanksgiving, he said. Happy Thanksgiving, Elias returned. Looks like you're carrying some kind of baby. Is that a kitten? The man grunted and shook his head. No, it's the runt, little piglet. Used to be when my girls were young, they'd take care of the runt for me. But they're grown and gone. It's just my wife and I, and I've killed the last few that I've had. But I just couldn't seem to do it today. A litter born on Thanksgiving? It just seemed like something I didn't want to do to ruin the day. He laughed humorlessly. I've been farming for 50 years. You think I'd be able to do this by now, but it's always hard. You bottle feed it? Catherine spoke up. We do. Keep it warm by the wood stove. I know my wife isn't going to want to take the time to do it, though. She hasn't been feeling great lately, and we've been talking about selling anyway. Plus, you get attached to them, and then they just die. Elias had noticed that Catherine's breath had quickened, and her eyes seemed to caress the little head that was sticking out of the farmer's jacket. Would you sell it? Elias asked and then almost clapped a hand over his mouth. What was he going to do with a pig? No, I wouldn't accept money for it. But do you have experience with animals? I live on a farm, chicken farm. But we've had dogs and cats and ducks and geese and horses and cows over the years. Well, I suppose that qualifies you to be able to raise a piglet. I'll give her to you. Really? Catherine said before Elias could say anything. Looks like your girl really wants it. An early Christmas present. I guess since Thanksgiving is over, we can talk about Christmas now, right? Elias said, grinning down at Catherine, who looked guiltily up at him. She'd always said she didn't want to hear about Christmas until Thanksgiving was over. It's funny that he remembered. I think the lady said we'll take her, Elias said. The farmer pulled the little body out of his coat, cupping it in his hands and handing it over. 
Merry Christmas. How are we going to feed it? Catherine said. I've got a bottle and some milk in the kitchen. I know the missus will be happy to share, especially if you're going to take it off her hands and she won't have to raise it. She's adorable, Catherine said, wonder in her voice as Elias took the little piglet from the farmer and set it gently in her hands. She cupped it immediately, instinctively covering it to keep it warm. It's not terribly cold out, but you want to protect it from the wind, the farmer said, but Catherine was already tucking it in her coat, and Elias smiled. Pigs were definitely not on his list of top favorite animals, but that piglet was nothing short of adorable, and even he was charmed. Catherine was in love. They followed the farmer to the house, and his wife, a sweet, gentle lady, showed them how to warm the milk and how to feed the bottle. She also told him how often they should do it and suggested a heating pad for the piglet, or a heat light, until it was older. A half an hour later they left, by mutual consent foregoing the rest of their walk, and headed toward Aunt Lenore's house. Oh, my goodness, Catherine said, sounding alarmed. I never even thought about it, but Aunt Lenore might not want the piglet in her house. I wanted to ask you about that. I heard Melinda telling you that she was going to be the one taking care of Aunt Lenore starting tomorrow. Oh, that's true. I guess, I guess I forgot. Maybe I pushed it out of my mind because it felt like I was getting shoved out of the way once more. Well, I thought maybe that was a good thing. I, I think we ought to provide a stable home for the piglet. Catherine giggled, and he took that as a good sign. You told me that you loved me. I didn't get a chance to respond. I feel like I should have said it first. Catherine, I love you. I have for a really long time. I just haven't done a very good job of showing you. I think you did show me. You just showed me in a way I didn't understand. I appreciate that, but I guess if you don't understand that I love you, or you don't see it, it doesn't really count, now does it? It does. Maybe sometimes I just have to search a little harder to see what love is. But kind of in the back of my head since you talked about my family, I was thinking... Maybe my dad showed that he loved me by leaving me with people that he knew would take care of me. By not dragging me around all over the countryside. Maybe he thought that would be good for me, and I was better off with what he did. Maybe I sat around thinking that he didn't want me for a really long time, when if I would have just said something, he might have told me he actually did want me, but he was making a sacrifice for my benefit. That's a really great way to look at that. It might not be true. Elias didn't know. He hadn't talked to her dad. But it was just as easy to be true as not. So, about the stable home that you were talking about, Catherine prodded. Well, I think that Whiskers, which is what she wanted to name her piglet, should be able to grow up in a home with both a mother and father. Studies have shown that children do best in such families. Surely piglets are very much the same as children, and we do want the best for little whiskers. You're sounding very analytical. Catherine, I don't want to live without you. I don't want to be without you. Wherever you are is where I want to be. Marry me. Or at least think about it. I guess we've spent so much time together over the years that we know each other about as well as anyone could. I don't know your likes and dislikes, but I know who you are as a person. And I love that. He lifted her hand up and kissed her knuckles. And I want to learn your likes and dislikes because they are important to me. So. You want to marry me for the pig? <laughs> no, I want to marry you for you. 
the pig's a nice benefit. She laughed, and he pulled her to a stop. Okay, full disclosure here. I want to marry you for you. The pig's a nice benefit. But that kiss in the closet? That was pretty awesome. Better than a pig. No offense to Whiskers. Her smile had widened until it was almost laughing. And maybe he shouldn't have done it. They were on the road, after all, and anyone could drive by. But he lowered his head and whispered, I think that might have been something I got right the first time. You nailed it, she whispered as she lifted her head and met his lips with hers. Epilogue Keen Emerson surveyed the living room where his brother, Elias, and his new wife had just said their vows. Decorated for Christmas, even though it was several weeks away, the living room sparkled with reminders of the holiday season with its message of hope and redemption. A new start. An unspeakable sacrifice. A gift worth more than man could ever pay. Keen finished reattaching the mistletoe to the top of the doorframe as Elias and Catherine thanked the pastor and the last of their guests for coming. It had been quite a packed crowd with all of Catherine's brothers and her parents, along with Elias's brothers and Graham in attendance. Once they'd decided to get married, they hadn't waited long, which made sense to Keen. No point in dragging one's feet if one had decided on the path the Lord had laid out for him. Of course, when a man didn't know what the Lord had in store. Keen adjusted the mistletoe so it hung evenly on both sides and stepped back. His brother and Catherine would be living in this house, which Catherine had closed up when she'd moved to take care of her aunt when they came back from their honeymoon. Elias had offered to sell his house in town to Keene, but Keene had declined. Not because he didn't want a house of his own, since he was currently living on the farm he'd grown up on, but because he was more interested in a farm of his own. It's what he'd been saving and hoping for. But he had never thought he'd do it alone. He assumed God would have a woman for him. It just hadn't happened. Did you get the boards for the new addition loaded on the truck? Pastor Cadell asked as he walked over to Keene, who hadn't moved from his spot by the doorway. He hadn't felt much like socializing. I do. I have the dry goods the church has donated as well. He'd loaded everything up himself while his brothers had helped Catherine's brothers decorate the house. It didn't look too bad, considering a bunch of men had done most of it. A few women, Catherine's stepmother and Braxton's wife, had made a lot of difference. There wasn't a deer head or a bit of camo in sight. Are you sure you don't mind taking it out? Not at all. I volunteered to do the building. I might as well take the supplies out with me. Pastor lowered his voice. Since Shelby's husband left her, she struggled. He never was a great provider, and she's not afraid to work. I know. Keen didn't mean to interrupt. He just didn't need Pastor Cadell telling him how wonderful Shelby was. He'd had more than one well-meaning person from the church extolling her virtues to him. Enough that he figured he'd been set up when he'd volunteered to put the addition on her house. But he knew Shelby from school, and they'd been total opposites. She'd been academic and musical, playing in the band and getting top grades in their class, while he'd been athletic and all about the agricultural program. It wasn't that he disliked her. They just had nothing in common. Still, when someone needed help, he didn't need to have anything in common with them to offer to throw in with everything he had. So even though he hadn't really talked to Shelby since they graduated from high school, and not much before that, he was more than happy to head out and put up an addition onto her house. Pastor Cadell turned as though he were leaving, but then he stopped. Have you seen the weather forecast? I'm a weather atheist. 
Huh? I don't believe in weather forecasts. They're wrong half the time. The other half, they're only partially right. If anyone else lied like they do on national TV, they'd be laughed out of business. Pastor Cadell looked at him for a moment, his mouth hanging open. Then he chuckled. Okay, as long as it's the weather you don't believe in, and you stand strong on God's word, I'm okay with it. God's word is nothing but truth. The weather? Not so much. Even though the Bible has proved itself right over thousands of years, people will still scoff at it while watching the weather and believing every word, even though it's wrong more than half the time. Pastor Cadell slapped Keen's shoulder. Great point, son. Maybe you missed your calling as a man of God. No, I was born to be a farmer. God put that in my blood just as sure as he put me in Iowa and wants me to sink deep roots. And raise a family? Yeah, I thought so. He needs to provide the other half of that equation first. He will, son, he will. Just don't be surprised when you find her in some unexpected place. Pastor Cadell walked off and Keen watched him leave. Elias had just found his soulmate and his best friend. Seems like it was a good idea to be friends with the woman you'd be marrying. But Keen didn't really have any female friends. None who were unmarried, anyway. Well, Lord, I feel like I'm ready for her. You just need to show me where she is. Nothing but silence met his unspoken prayer. Keen shook his head and walked over to congratulate the happy couple. While he was waiting, he could make himself useful. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.